Okay. Oops, link. And sound check one, two, one, two, one. And sound check one, two, one, two, one. All right, this is good. And sound check one, two, one, two, one. All right, this is good. All right, here, so I'm going to get started. So I'm working on Proteus. Um, so one of the main things I'm trying to uh, accomplish here is the, um, so for those who may not know, yeah, I just started. Uh, for those who may not know, um, you know, especially you see some of you guys are working on the build challenge. So the build challenge is for a non-complex aircraft. And so with a non-complex aircraft, you have a fixed pitch propeller. The pitch of the propeller always stays the same. And then um, a complex aircraft, you vary the pitch. Um, you know, essentially, when you're when you're doing a complex aircraft, uh, stand by. Let me just it's tough for me to type something. Um, all right, I'm just typing in a save here. So, um, so when you do a fixed pitch propeller, you essentially you choose either to have a climb prop or a cruise prop so let's say you you have your own plane and you often you know go on a couple hundred mile journey every once in a while um, you probably want a cruise prop when you're doing training work you often have a climb prop with a variable pitch prop you can always have the right uh, propeller pitch for the regime of flight you're in so when you have a non-complex aircraft you run the engine via rpm so as you change your throttle, you're changing the RPM. When you go to a complex aircraft, you have a you run the engine via manifold pressure, which is essentially telling you power, and you're running the propeller as RPM. And so what you want to do is you set your propeller to to govern your RPM, and it actually works with what's known as a prop governor. And so you have a prop governor, and it works with essentially you have a couple uh, weights. They're like think of two uh, weighted balls. And um, so as the prop spins faster than the set, and so you set it with a, I think it's a pin. And so as you, as you spin the propeller faster because of centrifugal force, the balls want to go out. And that then causes the propeller to now change pitch back, which causes the balls to come back in. So it auto governs. So you have a prop governor in the hub. That's why um, like this area will be where the prop governor is. And so... 
Um, that's how it automatically does it. So what I'm going to do is I'm switching over pretty much all my complex aircraft to kind of have this. And uh, I'm trying to just check chat really quick. And so um, what I'm going to do is, I so I've been thinking about this all week. And so what I think I'm going to do is, so the way that you govern your engine power is through manifold pressure. And so what you do is on your intake manifold, there's a reading essentially. And so you read how many inches of mercury um, your intake manifold is taking in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run off of my air intake and I'm going to take the information off of that. And that's how I'm going to get manifold pressure. And then I'm going to govern the RPM via PID. So I'm ripping all these, ripping all this logic apart to fix it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick one of my microcontrollers. Each engine has an independent microcontroller, and then I'll just uh, duplicate them. But um, I don't have to reconnect them. So I'm going to redo the system, and I think this is going to pay some dividends. So what I'm going to do actually first is I'm going to start by I need to do some testing, as is good. And then, um, because this is going to be my new system for all my complex aircraft, and so I'm just going to dump a ton of um, dials in here up, that I can use and plumb them up. And so the first thing I need to do is, can I read the appropriate number off of the intake manifold to make this work? Oh, nice, yeah. Um, just reading about the MACR. And so let's see. So what I want to do is um, the dog would stop chasing the cat. That'd be good. Ready? When you sit down, bub. And uh, let's go ahead and grab a microcontroller here. So I'm just going to make a quick microcontroller to read um, the composite off of the engine. Uh, one of the manifolds. I want to make sure I'm getting this correctly. Input. And then I want to read out the number. So uh, my engines are supercharged. And so I need to be able to read, I believe it is channel one. And so we will find uh, we will find out very quickly if it's one. Uh, three, I know, is temperature. Um, and so I'll show you in a second here. So if we take, let's see, in one of the engine composites, I'm just going to grab the same node so I know I'm getting the same value. And then I'm going to go in this microcontroller and then out the microcontroller to one of my dials. And so if we look at, oh, thank you, Brian. And so... Um, we look at the engine they'll show you how how my uh stuff works here so essentially we come in here i have the throttle throttle inputs a number uh it goes through a pid the pid then reads out a number and that number comes up to this uh formula through uh this form this here uh one two and three they read uh air and fuel that gives you your afrs your air and fuel ratios they go into the formula and then that's ported into um, both your air and your fuel here. And this formula here will give you um, essentially your air and your fuel. And so what I'm hoping is running off of one, I think, is going to give me that blower valve. And so what happens is you can go a max air value of one unless you're blowing extra air in. And so if we look at my engine, it's going to be hard to see here with the covered up. But I have a blower, so I have a supercharger in there. And the supercharger is blowing air directly into my air manifold. So I can go over 1. I can go, say, 1.67. And uh, that will give me a higher air value. If I get a higher air value, I can cram more fuel in. So it actually works pretty realistic how a turbo or supercharger works in real life. So what I need to do is I need to read that value off of my air manifold to then be able to tell myself... Um, that's going to be my manifold pressure. And that's going to give me essentially a notion of how much power my engine has. And so that's how I'm going to read um, my manifold pressure. So let's go ahead and let's pump on master power and avionics. Um, I have one set there. Let's bang on one. And so I don't see, I'm not getting a number here. So, okay, there it is. It's very small point. Triple O two. Let me actually pull this back on the workbench. So what I'm going to do here is I need to yank my engine cover off. And uh, let's see. Yank my engine cover off so I can see what I'm working with here. Is that going to yank? Crap, I don't want to. It is. Um, cut you.
cut you. So I'm just going to use one engine as my guinea pig. And then once I get the microcontroller kind of done, be a little bit of work reconnecting everything, but it will work better that way. And so you can kind of see the engine too as I work on it a little bit. But I've been thinking about this all week, kind of doing it. So again, I always strive for realism. That's kind of one of my joys in the game is trying to get things a little bit more simulator, a little bit more realistic. And so I want to run as a manifold pressure and RPM. And so I think this will be fun. Will it have the most utility in game? Who knows, but it will be fun. So that's the end of the... Let me check chat really quick. <laughs> There's plenty of people who could be my number one fan. Let's see. All right, so let's go ahead. And so right now I'm reading... Uh, so I open this up here. Uh, I need to open up more. And so I'm trying to be able to jump out on the wing and check the engine. I need to be able to compare my data with, um, you know, the data that I'm reading off my gauge with what my engine is actually running at. So, all right, so let's go ahead and pop that. And so I might have to do some decimal stuff, but I'm trying to make sure I can read the power of the engine to convert it to manifold pressure. So let's go ahead, avionics master power, one and... All right, so this is reading. It's just reading, as you can see. It's reading a very low number. So at idle, I'm reading about triple O two. So let's go ahead and get out there, and let's see what the fuel manifold's reading. 0 0.09. So ideally, what I want to be reading is that number. So I'm not sure what that is reading. So let me find. Okay, so that looks like it's reading stoichiometry. Maybe. I'm not sure. So that's not going to work for me. Um, trying to see how I can read what that value is because I'm setting a different value than it's reading because of the blower. So right now the propeller is at zero prop pitch, which the propeller is getting changed to. So let's do this. Let's crank it up. And so right now I have my engines as RPM. That's wrong. So I'm going to bang this up. So I have a set thrust of 20 RPS on there. Let's see what my blower's running at. So my blower's running. The other thought is to run it off pressure, but as you see, I'm not getting a good pressure value on that. I wonder, I could run it off of blower RPM. That's a thought. So right now, see, see I'm over, what am I at, 0.1 throttle? That's interesting. Okay, so I'm curious if I could read that liter per second of air off the... See, the problem is I can't read out of the air manifold. That's that's annoying. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think how to do this. So right now, I would assume that I'm running... Let me do this really quick. So let's go ahead. I put a bunch of dials on here because I know I'm going to need them. So let's go ahead and we'll expand this out. And I want to see what the two value reads for me. So we'll zing that out. We'll go logic, add a node. So again, this is going to be fake, so I don't need it. Um, let's see. Engine 1. This is going to be engine 2. And so these are the values of the engine composites. Engine 2, composite. Where are you at? There you are, guy. That's going to go there. And then so I'm going to read this. All right, so that's going to read 2. So I'm trying to see what my engine values are reading here. Because I'm not getting the blow val the uh, blower value, and I want that. So I need to try to read what these are doing because I want to set manifold pressure. I'm trying to get it as close to real life where it's reading that intake volume. I, could pro I might be able to do with a pressure gauge, but I need to do cap it somehow. So let's zoom that up. All right, so I might be able to run this number. This is this is giving me. Uh, I screwed up again. Crap. Need to pay attention to what I'm doing a little bit better. I didn't hook this up. This this node needs to go here. I'm gonna label these just so I don't screw them up. Um, one, two. All right. So let's get this going. And so I'm gonna try to read what's going on here. And I I. This doesn't need to be perfect. I just need some system that I can essentially uh, extrapolate what my engine's running at. So we have one here. What's two read me? Why is my engine running all funky now? Okay, it's stabilized. 
Okay. So let's see. You're running at. Okay, so let's see. So that's reading 1049. So I do not know what that is reading. So let's check the impeller pump. See, I could run it off impeller RPM, but I let's see if that's probably the same as that. See, that's running off regular clutched RPM. And then prop RPM is, where you at here? I'm trying to read this here. This would be, that's, I can't get in there without running the propeller. Make sure damage is off. Yep, player damage is off. That way I can walk into the propeller if need be. So I'm reading a low one number. So intake manifold is reading a 0.1 for throttle. So you see how low my throttle runs is that 0.1. I wish I'd yanked more off. All right. Yeah, I can't get in here to check my that. So I'm just trying to get a number that um, I'm trying to get a consistent number essentially that I can work with. So. The other thought is to run a pressure, but if you look at our fluid in, fluid out, we're getting this um, variable number. I definitely don't want that. Uh, we get a nice static number here of air flow of 0.3 liters per second. So let's tr uh, see. That's I'm interested how to read that off of there. Uh, let's see, 1089. See that 1089 number? If that 1089 is the same as I have in the cockpit, we're in business. So let's see. I just need a number, 1049. It's so let's go up that number, 1050. So I want to add two decimal places. Uh, let's see, let's add four decimal places to that number, and then. So what I was looking at, let me bring up the B29 chart that I um, found. So you know, a little bit of um, nerd, aviation nerdism for you guys here, if I can find it. Here is B B29 manifold pressure. So I'll bring it up here in a sec. So this is the gauge for the B29. And so if we look at the B29, ooh, I don't want to go to the link here. Let me see. Open image and new tab. I just need the image. So this is this is how you set your engines for the B29. So it, it looks complicated, but it's actually not too bad. Um, if you look on this side, you have your power from your engine. Um, and so it, it's all based on altitude, um, you know, your prop, how much bite it can take out of the air, the temperature. It's all about air density, essentially. And so right here, if you look, we have dry manifold. Uh, you have 28 inches of mercury, 26 inches of mercury, 24 inches, all the way down to 14 inches of mercury. Then you have your throttle, which is your, um, which is going to be your propeller of 2,700 RPM. And so if we look down, what's the center? So here's sea level up to 18,000 feet. So as you would um, gain altitude, of course, your air density is going down. Your propeller is going to have to take a different bite out of the air. So in a complex aircraft, you change both your power setting through manifold and you change your RPM of your propeller. And so let's say we're at 18,000 feet. We would want to set a, um, you know, we can set, if if we're going to have a manifold of 28 on our engine, we want to have 27 center our propeller. If we have 26, we want to have about 2,400 on our propeller. And you go down through that, and you're essentially setting your um, propeller and matching your manifold pressure to get your, um, to, to get your setup here. And so that's what I'm trying to kind of work with is um, have some notion of, of, of that reality. And so I, I need the numbers faked. Uh, they're not really faked. They're just, um, I'm kind of extrapolating what my engine currently does and making it work for me. So let's go in here and I need to get this number read. So let's go ahead into one. So one's the one we want, two I don't care about. Um, let's go ahead and come up with a formula. So uh, what I want to do is I want to take X. So I want to take X. X is going to be, remember, that was like 1049. I need to, um, how many hundreds do I need to do? 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. Uh, let's see. 
let's see what I read off of this. I'm just going to be doing testing, kind of. I'm trying to get, so if you looked on the B29, we get a um, manifold pressure of about 28 inches of mercury. And so I'm trying to get my inches of mercury looking correct there. And so, let's see. Okay, that's not reading correct. Oh, did I screw something up here? Did I not reconnect it? Oh, I didn't uh, f I didn't put in a uh, parentheses. That will do it every time. All right, so I multiplying it by 10,000. I'm just trying to get that number to be bigger. I, I want to work with a proper number. And then I'm going to convert it over to manifold. So I want to get this maxed out when I max my engine out. I want, yeah, I didn't cl close the parentheses. That's that's jittering just because, uh, you know, I haven't let the engine warm up yet. So now it's stable. Okay, so see now we're up to 10.49. So now I want to get to 28. So I just need to multiply that out to get 28. So multiply it by uh, 2.8 and then we'll be at 28. All right, I should have done that already, but again, have a parentheses problem and everything else, so. All right, so just coming up with a formula. So I'm converting essentially my, what I'm reading off of that engine node into manifold pressure. And so that's going to replace the RPMs and RPMs are going down to props. And so that's going to, I'm going to get jittering again on that. But this should give me hopefully around 2,800, uh, 28 inches of mercury at max. The engines don't like to be put up like a real engine right off the bat. So there you see I'm getting about 29 inches of uh, mercury. So that's going to work for me. So that's going to give me my inches of mercury. So we'll go up to 30 on these gauges and we'll be in business. So now my engines are converted from... No, I don't need it exactly. Um, you know, that's just a B-29 thing. You know, like a Mooney. Mooney is one of my favorite planes. I'll, I'll kind of nerd with you guys a little bit for a second. I was going to buy a Mooney, but um, just not worth the money for the amount of... Um, it's not worth the money for the amount of time I would actually use it. So this is... Let me open it up in a new tab. Here's a... Oh, wow, it's zoomed in. So here's a Mooney. This is what I wanted to buy. Um, wanted to buy a, let me switch, the sc screen should be switched over, right? Okay, there's just a delay in the stream. That's a Mooney. I love Moonies. Um, I wanted to buy a Mooney. So, like, that's around 27 inches of mercury. So, even a larger aircraft, you're still getting pretty consistent and close manifold pressures. And so, that's, um, you know, so different airplanes have different manifold pressures. So, it doesn't need to be exactly 28. I'm happy with this. So, we have 29 that works for me. So let's go ahead back in here and I'm going to convert some stuff here. So, all right. And so that is done. So the engine component is done. And so let's go ahead and click on my gauges here. So we have the RPM. So this is going to be number one manifold pressure. Uh, setting that now to a maximum of 30. Uh, two is going to be MP and that's going to be 30. MP, and that's 30. And then we have the last one, MP, and that is going to be 30. Now we need a fix. I should have done them all at once, but whatever, I'll do them here. That's going to be RPM. RPM. RPM, and that's going to be RPM. All right, so now let's go through and let's get the propeller RPM. Now, this one, I'm going to have to set it. Uh, I'm going to take off. I don't know if it varies air density, but it still will work. Um, you can still climb with a takeoff prop. It's not a, that's not an issue. Um, let's see what I'm doing here. Okay, that's set. Um, let's see. These values need to change. Um, 24, no, that's fine. 24, 24. I don't know what these will cap out at, but we'll check that. Um, but let me check that B29 manifold pressure chart again. Where are you? I open it in a different window. 
They've got three monitors and up with like 28 windows open at a time. So, so we're maxing out at 2,700. So let's see what I'm getting at there. Um, engines capped at 20 RPS, 6 to 1,800. So I'll have to put a little math in there to, to screw with that, to get that working, um, to just look correct again. A lot of it's faking it. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't really, it doesn't vary air density. Um, you know, they really need, need to make superchargers and turbochargers viable to make that work. All right, so let's go back in the micro and I need to start working on my prop. So at present, I do a very simple prop um, control and it doesn't even, I don't think it feeds through here. It doesn't feed through here. And so I need to go to where that feeds, which is actually easier that I put it somewhere else. Um, prop, 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 throttle prop controller right here. And so, let's see. Where's my prop? Here is my, doo -doo -doo, where are you? You are confusing me. Prop, 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 prop. There it is. Okay. And so this reverser, that's reverser. And so I'm actually getting rid of my reverse here. So that's fine, that's fine, that goes there. This is clamped out zero to one. That's why I don't have reverse. So I don't think I'm gonna do reversers. Um, reversers aren't gonna really, I'll leave all the logic in in case I later wanna screw with it. But um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set this. So I think I'm going to do a minimum value of 10% uh, prop pitch. And we'll go to a max value of 1 on the prop pitch. And I need to go through this and change. And actually, going to just change what I just did. Um, so let's see. This is going to be set via RPM. And so now I need to change all my variables. So... Right now I do 001, I want to keep that static. So we have a max value of one and I want to get a, I need to think what my propeller, so my engine RPM can go up to, uh, what are we reading? We're reading about tw uh, 20, so that's 1800 RPM. So I need to go max value of 1800. And then the minimum value is, So I'm trying to think how exactly to do this. I need to figure out what my minimum prop pitch is going to be. Okay, so this is going to be clamped out post PID. So I, I need to figure out my idle. So let's go and just get out of here really quick and check what my idle is set to. Uh, I can actually check it off the throttle, I think. I think it's set off the throttles. Uh, five. Five RPM is my lowest value, so I want to do five. Okay. So this is going to be five, uh, five times six. That's 300 RPM. So minimum number is going to be 300. Maximum number is going to be 1800. And then I have to do a conversion to get it up to um, the real. Let me just read a little chat here. Uh, 48, in, 48 cylinders per engine, I believe. So 300, 1,800. And so that should do that. But I'm trying to read my math here. Yeah, 300. So 300, 1,800. So that's going to be reading that. I've gone up... Um, So this needs to go up quite a few digits. So let's see, let's do 10 on that. All right, so then this here is gonna go, this here, all of this can go down here. That's a spaghetti mess, but it's gonna be fixed later. That can go there, reading of that. And then I wanna PID. Advanced PID because that's what's good. Um, let's see, constant number. Let's let's. Uh, I might have to tune this, but we'll run a p-value of 0.1 for now. And I want to go from here to there, and then I need to read in my RPM. So let's see, design. I have to, this is going to be a pain in the butt. 
Um, all right, let's not do this. Let's do it this way. Ah, crap. I should have stuck with that. Kind of trying to figure out what I want to do here. I think I just screwed myself doing that. I should have saved it anyway. Um, it's all right. It'll take me two seconds to fix it. So I'm going to do it here. It's going to require me expanding the microcontroller, but that's not the end of the end of the world. Um, let's do that. Let's take all these down again. I like to leave some of this stuff just in case I want to revert something because if it doesn't work, I'm gonna, I need to revert. Uh, let's go PID. And so this is gonna set my actual prop from goes from point one to one. That leaves that max there. I need to add in um, RPM. I, the problem is I'm gonna read need to read all engines. I could just do it as a composite. Um, yeah, let's read that. Make it one. I can make this bigger. I have space to make it bigger, so that's fine. Engine one RPM. Yeah, uh, I'll read RPM, engine one RPM. And then I want to go constant number. We'll do a 0.1 for this now, and then I'll change it later. If I need to, we'll tune it. Read that, and then where did that go? My new node. Where's my new node? All right, trying to find my RPM node. I'm just out of chat for a minute. So there it is. So. One thing I've been doing too now is if this is where they pop up, I've been trying to move the whole stacks. Oh, come on, grab it. And that way, when it pops up, it's not in the way. All right, so engine RPM1 is going to read as my process variable. Um, we'll start with a constant on for now, but I'll change it to um, when the engine comes on later. So constant on goes there. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to set my ARP desired RPM. The PID is going to control the RPM of the propeller, so the PID will auto auto run that propeller. And so we'll get that. All right, so that's kind of what I'm looking at there. Let's go ahead and start ripping this all apart and getting this running. And what is all this crap here? This is going to, that's running to my gauges. All right. And so I've been kind of thinking of this all week, how I want this to run. And so... We get these kind of lined up where I want them, and that will help me get this kind of set up. All right. So I want to, let's see. So you go there, and you go there. You can go bye bye. And so this I can either run by one of the keys on my seat or I can run my propeller via some independent control so I can manually work my propellers. That's why there are some ores in here. Okay, and then this, oh, get out of here. Grab the wrong thing. Let's actually nix all these and grab, that way I can get rid of this, this tail here. Where's this tail going? Right there. Okay, and then I need to grab all of you. Okay. There and there, and then I need to move all these Johnnies down. All right, I'll be out of chat for a minute, just kind of Getting these tailed up, and then I'll check in with you guys. All right, so those are in, and then I need to run the rest of those. So let's go ahead and save you. Let's yank you out of the wing. I do have some expansion room, but I like to pull them out of the wing just to make sure I don't cut any holes in anything I don't want to. Let's just go ahead and put a, some extra width on this panel. Thank Go up this way, that way, that'll work. 
Okay, so we have three more engines that need to read their RPMs. So... All right. This is the issue with having four engines is that uh, everything has to be done four times. Up oh, and I keep just <laughs> I just keep copying two. There we go. All right. And so this is going to read the four RPMs off the engines. All right, so that's good. Um, and then I need to get all those. So now these all appear over here. That's why I moved the whole stack. All right, what do we got here? Two. Two's coming in here. Three. Three's coming in here. And four. And these will all need to be pit tuned, but I think point one should probably work all right with them. They might need to be a little higher because I'm running at a high, a high number. I'm actually running the real RPM, so... All right, that sets that up, and let's go there. All right, so we are hooked up there, and so hopefully that will work. Um, let me see, constant ons, constant ons are all plugged. That's fine. This is good. That's running. That should be a reasonable variable. Let me check in with chat. All right. Yeah, Mooney sit really low. Let me see where we're we at. Uh, fuel. This is actually very fuel efficient. This this airplane. It cost me fourteen hundred dollars to go from um, FJ Warner up to the Arctic. Let me see where we at. I do have separate ECUs for each engine. Um, if you look, I have an ECU for each engine. These are all the engine ECUs. This is a prop. Uh, this is just prop control here. So prop control is done separately. So I have a single prop control, and then each engine has its own ECU. All right, so this is going to read out a uh, minimum prop value of 0.1, maximum prop value of 1 through the whole set. We have a good stack there. Then I need to read this out, so... Uh, what is this? This is reading prop to avionics. Let's go ahead and you get dragged up here and filled. So you're going to read. Nope, you're going to read. Um, so this should all be reading engine RPM. So engine RPM is what we're reading here. And so engine 2 RPM engine 3 rpm so i want the actual rpm of the engine i don't want what the pit is reading me and that's going to come down here clean as a whistle and that's going to go come on you drag all right so now i have readings this is all junk for if i ever want to convert something or screw with it i have a stack down there okay so this is set up let's go ahead and um i think i re-indexed all the gauges yep that's fine so let's give this a shot um, all right, so let's go ahead and play with this. Let me see what I need. So I don't need this anymore. So this crap in the de in here can go. That can go. This can go. All right. And you need to go back in the wing. You're now bigger. So you can go in here and not cause me problems. The nice thing about having a huge aircraft is space for days for microcontrollers. All right, so the props are taken care of. The engine is, engine control for one is taken care of. I think we are running all right on that. Let's check what I did on this. If it's not obnoxious, I will, so let's see. That's fine there. So I'm running throttle, I'm running RPS, that's coming up. It's just going to read manifold pressure. So I really didn't do anything here. All I did was the readout is different. Ah, crap, what did I do? Um, what did I do? What did I do? Oh my, I just deleted something I didn't want to delete. Um, let me bring it back. 
I just want to read this here really quick. Let's copy that and then let's fast forward that and then you can be repasted. And so this is just re my readout now. So I just need the formula and uh, it's actually pretty easy. I don't I was afraid I was going to have to redo all my ECUs. I don't have to. So this is going to read out uh, value one off the engine and it's going to read it here. So that's good. Copy that formula, we should be good. And then I'll take each engine ECU and go in there. So where am I reading to? I'm reading to Avionics 1. That is reading RPS. So this is going to go here, and this is going to replace that. That goes 1 there, that goes there. So bingo, that is done. And if I get the line straight, that would make me happy. But I can't. Ugh, angled. Um, if I hit, don't have straight lines, that drives me nuts. There we go. That's better. All right, so that's good. Um, and so it actually doing it this way helped because you know I was gonna have to copy each of these ECUs and reconnect them, which is ah uh, you devil. I didn't mean to do that. Um, I meant to get in here and accidentally launched it. All right. So this is actually pretty simple. Uh, so this was the way to do it. It's going to take me much less time to do it this way. And then, uh, again, I have to be annoying and move this so that it's lined up the way I want it. Make sure I saved one. I hope I saved one. Yep. Okay, good. And then three. So this is actually really easy. This turned into, I, I thought this was going to be a pain trying to get this converted out, but it looks like hopefully should run all right though the p values are probably going to be all screwy just because i'm running um the engines will run fine the propellers i might have to play with the p values of my pids to get them right um so we'll kind of assume that they're going to be jittery and weird and obnoxious at first all right so that's good um update you now my prop value is going to be off they're going to run to a maximum of 1800 uh let's see so that's fine. I'll read them as 1800s for now. And then um, if it's not running right, we'll do that. Let me check chat. Yeah, that's I. That's why I did the post. The I posted um, on Discord and on YouTube. That way the post comes up before the live. Sometimes the live messages come up late. So I tried doing a post as well. All right, master power, bang, bang, bang. Bang, 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 bang. Okay. Engines seem to be running. They're a little jittery. That's fine. That's p-value nonsense. We're getting some turn. Oh, yep, so we're already at one. Um, so I have to read what's up. So my propellers are probably throttle up too high. I know why they're throttle up too high. All right, so my propeller, let me get out of here. Um, so my propellers are over pitching because um, they're under revving to what I'm setting them as. So let me try to read you. Can I read you without you chopping me up? Oof, that's scary. Come on, come on, come on. So I can't read what my props are actually getting. Um, it's over propping me. That's why the plane wants to move. So I need to fix this. Let's see, RPMs are not reading. You're not reading at all, are you? Nope. Manifold pressure is reading, I think, all right. Now that I'm up against the building, let's go ahead and check this. Vehicle damage is off. Let's go ahead and just crank one up. All right, so my manifold pressure reading is way off now. I don't know why this is all screwed up. I have to look at this. Yeah, so that should be going up to a max. So I put in something wrong. All right, so I just need to read the props, and I need to see why the manifold pressure is donkey. So I screwed something up with manifold pressure. So what's that reading off of? That's reading off of this. Let me check my formula. Reading off engine one. I thought that's what I was reading off of before. Um, hmm. Let's read a straight value. All right. So the reason why the airplane came shooting out of the hangar there is I am. I'll show you here. So it's trying to vary my props right off the get-go. 
me see where my propeller is. So my starting value should be... Okay, so this is what my issue is going to be. All right, so I need to play with this. This is going to be weird. Um, hmm. Okay, I need to try to remember how this is going to go. So, huh. I'm trying to think how I'm doing this. Let's see, this is going to be weird. Uh, I'm trying to get it to work realistically, but I'm trying to think how to convert the game into realism. So, like, realistically, what you do is when you start, your prop is all the way forward. That is going to be at about 10%. And then I'm going up. Um, the other thing I could do is just run it off of. Hmm, I'm trying to think how to get these props to behave themselves. How the hell to do this? I could fake the RPM num I could get the engine RPM numbers to read out. Um, let's. I might be overcomplicating this like crazy. So let's do this. Let's update this. Let's go ahead and let's do this. Um, we're pretty. We didn't make much progress. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, I actually didn't get too far on this. Let's save this. Let's load in regular Proteus. I learned about what I needed to learn on this uh, with this test. So where's Proteus backup? Proteus backup. All right, let's go ahead and save this as Proteus MP and RPM work backup. All right, so we're back where we were, and the difference is going to be this. Um, so let's see. So I want to read... We'll start out. We'll start out e easy here. So we'll take this one value. I'll read it to my gauge, and we'll leave. Uh, let's yep. Let's go through all, every one of them and do that. I'll come out see because my manifold pressure was screwed up already. So I'm going to read it like this. So this is going to be the easiest way to do this. So let's go ahead, read through each one of these manifold pressures. Like so, and then I think all I, I see, I, uh, I hit the wrong button again. So all I really need to do is I actually don't need to do is I'm overcomplicating this and I'm going to kill the actual vehicle's performance the way I want it. So by doing this, I think we're going to actually get better. So let's uh, drop that in. Because a lot of this is just, um, essentially, it's just information. The, the engines work right. The props work right. What I need is just, I need it to read correctly. So I might switch it over more so it's a read issue so it's just reading the way i want all right so now we have this so let's go ahead and go full throttle on all my engines so and you see that number is nice and small again so let's get a max engine reading number on this engines sound good all revved up together it's so right there there's my so we're getting 2080 Okay, so I wish my note, I need to get another notebook. My notebook is pretty much, oh, nope, it's not full. Okay, there we go. So we're getting 2080. You know what I'm going to do? There's no point in me trying to replicate a B29. I have 2080 as my manifold pressure number right now. And my engine RPM goes up to about 1,800. 2018 is a reasonable manifold engine RPM combination. That's fine. Let me look at the chat right, real quick. Just going through. Yeah, with me getting close to the prop, yeah, the uh, <laughs> OSHA's not thrilled with that. Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's good to see everybody participate in the challenge. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, one one thing with the money limit too is realize this is a trainer, and one of the reasons I put the money limit in there is it's a trainer. It's not supposed to be super expensive. It's supposed to be affordable. 
And so, you know, you want to, you know, the trainer doesn't need too many bells and whistles. At the end of the day, you're training private pilots how to fly, you know. Um, like some of our trainers had very little instrument gauges because you didn't need them. You weren't doing your instrument rating. And then we had other planes that we, that we had more expensive instruments than that we do for instrument training. So this is what I'm going to do. So this is going to be, it's not going to be cheated. Essentially, my, I'm still going to be able to control my props and my engines the way I want them. But what's going to happen is it's going to, it's going to read the information to me differently. So think of it this way. It's like you can drive your car. If you know you have to shift gears at 1400 RPM, well, if I convert it to RPS, you're still shifting your gear at the same speed, engine speed. The difference is the number you're shift, you're you're moving at. You're you know, you're dividing it out so um, by 60. So you know, if it's at 14, let's say 1800, you know, divide it by 60. Now instead of shifting gears at 1800, you're shifting gears at 20. You know, so that's all I'm doing here. So by doing it that way, it's going to be better. Why? Uh, why? I don't get this. How how are my generators on? Okay, I am gaining. I was gonna say, if I'm losing electricity with with my engines at max thrust, no, they're not. It's just um, the pit took a second to catch up. All right, so I'm gonna make this much simpler. So I was starting to do this too complicated, and I'm gonna make it much simpler. So right there. So I need to go up one, two, three. Three is that's ten. That's a hundred. That's a thousand. Yeah. So it should be ten thousand. 10,000. Is it 10,000? No, maybe it's 1,000. Somebody do the math for me. I'm, I'm trying to move my decimal. One, two, three, four. If I need to move, yeah, four decimal places is, is going to be uh, 10,000. So it should be a 10,000 multiplier on there. Let me just test it. Uh, let's see. Let's try this now. So this is giving me manifold pressure. So this is actually reading out my engine power, which is what I want. Let's test this here. And the nice thing is, this is going away, is eventually I'm going to make it so my engines, um, so my propellers stay. Uh, they, they go to a minimum of uh, 10%. Yes, it was 10,000. Okay, so you know what it is? You know why my um, my manifold pressure is going over 20 is because now I have boost. Once I get blowing, so it, this is actually an interesting game element. So see how I'm at 24? The propeller is actually blowing air into my rams. I'm actually getting boost off the propeller, which is realistic. And so this has zero, um, this has zero pitch and is already still turning me. All right, so that works perfectly. So that's easy. So this is a much simpler way to do this, and this is going to save me headaches upon headaches. So let's do it this way. Oh, I hate that you're sitting there. Let's. Ugh. I can't take. I can't take not straight lines. It just drives me nuts. There we go. <laughs> can't take it. It's just it bothers me like nobody's business. All right, so this is actually, this is going to make life not only much easier, but um, so uh, what I was trying to do is reinvent the wheel to just essentially get a different reading. So I needed to think of it kind of in that sense, like I was saying, is, you know, the difference between reading it as RPM and RPS is it doesn't matter. You're doing the same job. You're just trying to um, output data differently. And that's, I know how to run my engines and my propellers. I just need to... Um, essentially read them in a different way. So that's kind of a better way to think of what I'm doing here. The plane is still going to function the same. It's just going to um, give me my data in a different way. So, All right, so now my engines are fine. Let's go ahead and set these gauges back up. It was kind of annoying that I had to go through and change these again, but it's it's not a big deal. Manifold pressure. So we have our manifold pressure. So these are all MPs. All right, and then you are going to be all RPMs. Oh, nope, 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 here. And so all we're doing is we're changing kind of the nomenclature of how this is done.
And so this will make me much happier having these correct. All right, so we're capping out about uh, 2,000. So let's do... All right. And so this is going to be just reporting engine RPM. So again, I was trying to reinvent the wheel for no particular reason. And I'm just I'm making a mess of this right now because I could do this much more efficiently. But uh, so we were going to what we were going to 24 inches of, of mercury. So let's go to 26s on these. I just want to make sure the gauges just barely go above where I want them so that a full gauge is a full gauge. All right, so that is set. So we have manifold pressure up to 26. We have RPMs up to t up to 2,000. We have manifold pressures up to 26, and we have RPMs up to 2,000. Beautiful. All right, so let's go ahead and screw with the props now. So again, I do independent prop control in here. And so let's go ahead and set these up. So right now we're going from, I don't need the clamp anymore in here. Um, So this is this is my reverser. Uh, I might do a reverse. I'm not sure at some point. I doubt it. I'm kind of not wanting a reverser. So let's go ahead and I could leave this mostly connected. Let's go ahead and my minimum now is going to be 0.1. Maximum is 1. There we go. And so, yeah, we'll just do this. So 0 0.1, 1. And so this hopefully will be simpler. And I just want to make sure this reads the new way I want it to read. And we'll see if it, if it behaves like a real airplane. I'm happy. I don't need it to be perfect. And this is going to cut down a lot of the um, a lot of the nuisance. So let me check chat while this is loading in. Yeah, I figured this this um, you know I wanted a pretty simple challenge for the first challenge and. I wanted to give plenty of time, and especially with the holidays, you know, a lot of people are getting done right away, which is nice. And then um, if let me get no guys, if if like, you know, five or six of you guys are done early and you want another like challenge, you know, I might do a weekly or two week challenge on top of this one. Um, something simple just to go alongside it, um, you know, and then anyone done can kind of participate in that as well. But um, I have to kind of keep an eye on how many people are participating. If I get 28 entries, it's going to be like four four or five videos to get it done so I kind of have to be careful on that so I have to be careful here my propellers sh should be starting at tens at 0.1 percent all right so my rpm is see this is wrong now this is what's going to annoy me mm. oh I didn't hook it up right that's why okay um, let me have to rehook these. So those gauges should be reading. What are they reading now? I forget what these are reading. What are you reading, son? Um, where are you going to? Who's who's going to where? Okay, I need to read. So this needs to read out RPMs now. Uh, where is go? Where is this going? These are daisied up. Uh, here. You're daisied, you're daisied, you're daisied. Where do you read from? Okay, these read there. Where the hell is this going? Uh, let's see. You daisy there. You daisy to... Wow, this is being annoying. Um, that goes there. That goes... Where is my... Okay, this daisy's here. That's where my daisy starts. So right here. What the hell is going on here? I love when you can't remember how you hook something up. Uh, all right, where are you going there, son? You go there? Who's who's reading you? Okay. I am so confused. Uh, right there. Right here. It's off avionics RPM. Okay, avionics. I actually hooked this up in a logical way. I just can't friggin' remember what I'm doing. All right, so RPM panel's coming up. I need to read these out. Expressions, x times 24, what are you doing? 1, 2, 3, 4, deposit read 1, 
All right, uh, I gotta figure out what the hell I'm doing here. One of these is RPMs. I gotta re figure it out. Uh, tail gear position. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at, guy? That's temperatures. So these are my temp readings here. The threes. Need to find where the hell I'm running my RPMs. Uh, all right. Let me see where I'm running my RPMs here. I need to report all my RPMs, so I gotta find them. Port fuel tail gear position. Okay, um, let's see. Where are my RPMs reporting now? So RPMs are reporting there. So let's see. Engine each engine panel should be reading in. Okay, so I need to see where my RPMs are reporting because those prop gauges um, need to re report out RPM. Where's RPM? RPM, right here. All right, so it's it's reading to nothing now. I need to change this. So this is going to go out to avionics 1. So 2 is available. So this is now reading uh, RPM to 2. So that will work. All right, update you. Um, yep. You know what? Let's do this. Uh, let's verify this avionics because what I need to make sure is um, I can actually very easily do this and not have issues if I'm careful and put them in the right spot. So let's uh, do this. So RPM 1 reads on 3, so it should be 3478. 3478. And let's check where 3478 are attached here. So we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 3, 4. It's going to be 1, 2, like that. Uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 7, and 8. You're going there. Okay, so these are reading off of prop panel. All right, so prop panel comes in. So these need to read differently. So these need to actually come off of these here so i think these are what i'm running okay so that's not bad let's get these red so like right here if i look at my readouts we are running one one runs to that signal there what is this going to here what are you communicating to your avionics one goes to two three four okay so that's one two three four that's reading out avionics Let's go ahead and get back in here, check what channels I need to run these on. So manifold pressure is running correctly off of channel one. So I need to run channel two to all of these essentially. So prop panel is no longer commanding these. So what I need to do is right here, I need um, one goes to there. This will read channel two. 2 goes to here, reads channel 2. That's easy. You can go, bye bye you do nothing now. 3 will read here to channel 2. 4 will read here to channel 2. And that's all she wrote there. So that actually is pretty simple, pretty logical, pretty easy to get those cleaned up. So this actually turned into less of a project than I thought it was going to be mercifully and then you are useless now to me so all right good so now i need to go in here and very simply fix these so this now it's actually all set up i just need to reconnect some stuff all right so you now plug to two channel two so this is actually turned into a really easy swap over so i'm glad i changed the way i was going to do this to a little bit more logical i'll check up a chat in a second let me just get this spawned in See how you guys are up doing. And we'll see how this runs. So this gives me better control over my airplane. I don't like too much automation, like new aircraft auto prop. I'm not into that. Let me check you guys out. What are you, what are you doing here? Let's see. Yeah, um, 20 grand is the max of the. Um, max cost um it's actually not bad mine is running at 16,000 and i have a i have quite a few monitors i have what do i have six six monitors in there and it's running that i don't have any antennas um 
but um, run at 16. You turn it on. All right, so let's see if this is reporting correctly. What is up with that RPM? What, what are you reading uh, crazy RPM for? Look at that RPM. What is going on, man? That's that's insanity. Manifold pressure is probably reading a little low, but uh, let's go ahead and bring him up. <laughs> so, uh, the, some one of my calculations must be off. I need to look check it. All right, so I need to re-index these gauges up to 30s. I'm getting actually they're blowing better now, so I need these at 30. That is insanity. I need to figure that out. Let's see if I can take off. I should be able to take off with this, no problem. Um, I want to make sure I can take off with 10% um, prop. I might need more prop to take off. My brakes on, my brakes are on. No, my brakes are off. All right, so I can't take off with 10% prop. So I need more prop to take off. So we'll change it, make a couple changes here. So I don't know what, what I screwed up in the calculation there, but that needs to be fixed. So you are all going to 30 now. So must have screwed something up somewhere. Okay, that's going through. Let's check all of this and see where. I, I think I know what I screwed up here. So these are reporting to avionics, and then I put in, a, I know what I did here. See, they're all multiplying by 2400, so I don't need that anymore. I need them, they're reading, they, these don't need to be 60s, so that's why they're all screwed up. They're just way overblown now. I was doing it a different way, now I need to fix it. So that's a, that's a simple fix, 60s. 60s. Okay, that's done. Let's go to prop panel. Let's change this out. Let's see if I can take off. I need to take off test. So um, you should be going. Are you going there now? You are. Okay, that's good. So you need to go to, let's try um, let's just go right. Let's try 15% prop see if that gets me off the ground um, I need to be able to take off the ground with so when you take off in an, in a uh, complex aircraft you want to do low pitch high RPM and the reason is think of it this way with low pitch you have a very thin paddle on a canoe and because the paddle is very thin you're moving very little water every time you stroke and so when you stroke through the water you can go paddle 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 and so you can easily paddle quicker or slower because the paddle is very thin. You're doing very little work. And so in order to do enough work, you need to move the paddle very fast. You think about it, if you're trying to move a canoe and it's like, you know, very thin, you'd have to move that paddle a lot to get the canoe moving. Um, if you have a huge paddle that's like the size of a snow shovel, you would need, you do like paddle, paddle paddle and so when you're when you're taking off or landing you need to be able to mo change your engine very quickly and so the more work your engine's doing it's doing that struggling of trying to move a ton of water it's trying to move a ton of air so you want low pitch high rpm and you want to be able to change your engine uh very quickly and so that's why you set it that way so we're going to try taking off just straight ahead with 15s so this should uh, rpm should be reading correctly now get these engines up and stabilized rpm still reading nuts what the hell all right i need to look at that again uh manifold's fine that's running let's go ahead so our props are set to a minimum of 15s now breaks off let's just take a head go ahead and take off straight let's put a notch of flaps in let's let's uh bang out of here straight ahead i need to see what the hell is up with these numbers something's up Here we go. So I should be able to take off like this. Uh, probably need to go to 20% on my um, propeller to take off. 
We're just, we're barely able to take off. Um, yeah, so 20. All right. All right, I still need to figure out what the hell is going on with my RPMs. They're reporting very high. You know what I'm doing? I bet I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Okay, I'm doubling it. I'm doing a 60 here. Where am I? That's what I'm doing. If you look, multiplying by 60 and then I'm multiplying by 60 again. So I'm multiplying by 60 times 60. So, so this, is, this is adding extra nonsense in there, but it'll be fine. There we go. This should fix my RPM. I know what I'm doing. I, I was, uh, because I used to read it off of a different area, and so I had to do the formula here, and now I'm doing the formula somewhere else. So I'm doing the conversion in avionics. I'm actually trying to do the conversion twice, so it's doing 60 times 60. So it's doing 3,600 times the um, RPS value. There we go. All right, so that is fixed. Um, these need to go up to, let's try 20s. I don't want to go too high on the prop. And also, my airplane's been taken off too quick. I want to make sure my airplane's taken off in a realistic distance. So this should, let's go to 20. Hopefully it's 20. Hopefully I don't have to go to um, 20. It doesn't matter if I have to go to 25, but just like to get this thing taken off and see. The other thing in game is like once you hit a critical prop pitch, it just wants to go and it's not really realistic. Let me look really quick. Yeah, 6,000 RPM. Let me see where you guys are at here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't take random spaghetti. I have to, like, I, you know, like, I already made this plane work, and I'm like, let's go remake it so the gauges read differently. And if my crap spaghetti, it just, it's too much of a nightmare. All right. RPM is stable. Uh, manifold pressure stabilized. RPM is reading a reasonable RPM. Look at that. All right, let's go ahead. So our prop should be starting at 15%. I, so one of the reasons I don't want to go too high is I want to make sure that brake holds me. Now, my wheels are uh, gripped, are XML gripped, because I want it to actually behave realistically. So as you see, parking brake still holding us at idle thrust. That's good. Let's go ahead and try to take off. Let's go ahead and go 20. Let's go ahead and start advancing our thrust. The sound of these engines revving up together. Four engine plane just sounds right. Okay, we're going to take off with this, I think. We might need 25s, but... Might need 25s. I'm thinking 25 should do it. Yeah, we, we need more thrust, so... Probably 25, I'm thinking. It takes off, but it's very sluggish here. So that's not bad. Let me fold my tail. Not that it does anything, but we'll fold the tail up. So let's see what my speed is. See, I'm, I'm, I'm not terrible, but see what we'd have to do. Manifold. Wow, look at my manifold pressure now. Why am I controlling my manifold with one and two? What is going on here? Oh, you know what it is? Okay, I need to fix that. That's not right. All right. That is weird. Okay. All right, so I need to fix my props. Like, that was my old way of controlling my props. So there's RPM. Let's go ahead and try to control a prop, and I need to do some testing here. So let's set my manifold to... Let's go to, I don't know, let's go to 30 manifold. And let's start trying to fix these props. All right, so this is going to be screwy for me. All right, I used to control this system differently, so I need to change up my control regime here. All right, so that's fine. Uh, starting to make good progress here. Let me see where we're at. All right, so let's try to fix this up. So we're getting there. Um, the gauges are now in the neighborhood of where I want them. I need to just um, control, fix my control scheme. All right, so that's being controlled through throttle prop. That's what all this noise and nonsense is in here. So my props are controlled by two things. 
the one two key so we have uh, prop panel so this is the prop panel um, this reads the actual number buttons and then here we have seat seat commands will run my um, numbers up and down so one and two run my props oh, this is reading manifold pressure though I don't know why I'm not changing rpm the way I want this is kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> how to get this to work right. So let's do this really quick. Um, trying to see how the hell to do this right. Um, so that is running prop panels one and three, two and four, five and seven. Huh. See, this is this is screwing up my manifold pressure too much. Being annoying, this twenty percent. Let's go to twenty fives on this. Um, that was a little bit sluggish for what I want. So let's go twenty fives. Hopefully, this doesn't screw it up. I really don't want to have to go back to the other way I was trying to do this. All right, so that's good. Uh, let's see. I can still control them with one and two. That's there. Reading out my prop numbers. That's fine. Okay, I need to change this. So see, it's it's resetting at um, zero start value, reset value. Let's make that 0.25 as well. I wonder if I if they weren't starting off at I think no they were starting off at the value that they were supposed to that should that should not be a problem. Um, now I'm getting concerned this isn't reading correctly. I need to check it because as I add prop I should be cutting my RPM. So let's go ahead and try it. I want to see what it's doing. I need to take it through its paces, see what it's doing, and then I can decide what I need to do, and then I'll break off and there's some other work I want to do in Proteus that needs it. So let's get you started. So um, I up the um, prop on this to see if this um, will let me take off. I want to make sure idle does not move me with the parking brake on. It appears I'm not moving, or very slightly. I can increase the grip on the tires. Nope, I'm sitting. Okay, it was just moving me a little bit, but we're stationary. Still stationary, that's all I care about. Let's take the brake off. Let's do a real takeoff here on a runway so I can see what it's doing. Nice. So now we have a minimum prop set. Manifold's going to be interesting. Again, I'm trying to read off of a weird number. Um, I, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm actually essentially doing? I am taking... So manifold pressure is... It comes in the intake manifold. All it's really doing is it's, it's essentially giving you a representation of engine power. Uh, what I could do is run a torque gauge and run torque and see what the torque is, and that will give me power output. And as I put load on, the torque should go down. That's another way to do it. So let's go ahead and let's taxi out. My tailwheel needs work, too. So manifold pressure coming up. And so I'm going to start cutting off my um, starboard most engine. And as you can see how nicely we turn, I'm not doing any steering. I'm using all asymmetrical. Then I'm going to start coming back on all four screws. Now we'll straighten us out. We'll start coming back up on the screws. You don't call them screws, but let's go ahead. We'll go beacon on. We'll fold our tail. We'll put the logo light on. So the other thing I want to accomplish this episode is you notice how tiny my tail number is. My tail number is going to change. It's going to be uh, November 68936893Charlie. Uh, and so it actually might not be that long. I might do November 683Charlie. Um, Charlie, I think is what I'll do. Because November is for U.S. airplanes. The uh, tail number starts with November. So let's taxi on out. I missed the elevator. I used to have an elevator in this, but it just it caused some physics issues, so I took it out. But 
At some point, if I can get an elevator, figure it out. The elevator's going in the back. The elevator was cool. I would select my floor, and it would pick which floor. But I kind of like this manual climbing system. Let me see where you guys are at. Oh, yeah, yeah. They just made, read maximum torque. That's true. I could just do it off of... Uh, see, all right, That would give me a dual reading of RPS. That's not going to work. My logo light needs to probably come in maybe two blocks as well. I don't like that shadow it puts on that upper block. Yeah, you're right with the torque. Torque's pretty useless. Um, the other thing I was going to do is a pressure gauge, but I can't get a consistent reading on the pressure gauge. All right, so we want to take off at low pitch, high RPM for takeoff, and then I need to get us into different regimes of flight and see what I can do. So we're see we're showing an RPM of 613, and so this is behaving pretty reasonable. You have your manifold pressure, and you have your um, RPM. Let's go ahead, come up on number four to help turn us. And it'll come up, and then I'll back them all off, and I'll reset them. So the asymmetrical thrust, especially something this big, is really helpful. So backing them off, they're all zeroed, coming up, and we'll turn on the runway. Let's check fuel balance. My fuel, okay, I have full fuel in there now, so we're good. So this this has 70,000 pounds of fuel on there. Now about 63,000 pounds of fuel on board. All right, so we're ready to take off. Nav lights, strobes, taxi lights, do uh, landing lights on the roll. Flaps are coming. Nope, flaps are set. Yeah, so let's do a check. Uh, takeoff checklist. Flaps set. Lights are on. Props are set. Uh, takeoff checklist complete. Let's go ahead and come down on one and two. That will help turn us. All right, I'll back them off for reset, and we'll reset them. So this is a nice way I can control all four engines pretty reliably doing it this way. Come off of one. I'm holding one as I bring it off. There we go, resetting them. Fuel balance is good. Takeoff is ready. So we used to have this button on the Embraer that was uh, takeoff config. And you'd click that, and it would go, take off, okay. And so if your flaps, if everything was set up correctly, it would give you a take off, okay, and you knew you were good to go. So let's go. So coming up on manifold pressure. Manifold pressure really dances like that because all it is is an air pressure sensor on your manifold intake. There we go. Oh, yeah, we're going to have no problem taking off now. There we go. Positive rate, gear up. Drop our nose just to here. I'm going to come up on thrust a little bit. Now bring our flaps up. Flaps coming up. Okay. All right, so we want to do a climb. Uh, manifold pressure is reading high now. I'm going to have to figure that out. All right, so how to get this to run properly. So I need to go... Okay, these gauges that... Remember I said these were indexed wrong? So let's see... Um, so I'm trying to remember, when we would climb, you want to reduce um, throttle, and then you want to reduce um, props. So we would go 25 squared. So let's go down just a hair on that. So let's go down to like 40-something. And then I'm going to start bringing down my props. So so what am I? I'm trying to see what I'm looking at here. Okay, let me pay attention to what I'm doing here. Uh, taxi light's coming off. So I don't know why my props, I don't know if I'm actually moving my propellers or not. Let's go ahead and put in some autopilot stuff so I don't have to fly as much. So I'm trying to look at my, okay, we're good. Um, let's go ahead, autopilot, altitude, hold. Let's pick a heading, 75, 75 is coming in. I want to test this out, see what's up. All right, so let's go full throttle again. Starting to bring, uh, let's increase my propeller. So see, it's also bringing my manifold pressure up. Um, 
should be bringing my manifold pressure down, frankly, because I am putting extra strain on the engine. So I need to see what's up with that. So my manifold pressure is going to be reading incorrectly. Actually, you know why it's bringing the manifold pressure up? I can tell you right now. The manifold pressure is going up because as I increase the pitch of the blades, it is blowing into these, uh, these intakes because I'm supercharged and I have two rams. It's actually, the game is actually blowing air in from the propellers into my uh, scoops, into my intake. So I bet that's cranking my manifold. So in real life, uh, if we bring up the B29 chart again, let me find this friggin' thing here. Where are you at? Wrong chart. Here it is. So here's the B29 chart. As you see, um, should be capping out around 28 to 30 manifold pressure. Uh, as we want to bring down our manifold to 26, we'd go to 2400. So this is not reading, so I need to come up with some sort of way to read that engine. So I'll figure it out. Um, again, it's just a gauge. The plane works exactly the same. It's just um, reading the gauge. So I need to figure that out. So let me go back to chat. We got 28 windows open. That's interesting because watch this. Um, if I so I have a supercharger and I have two air rams, and so I'm down. My RPM is down, which is correct. As I increase prop pitch, RPM should get, come down because I'm putting more load in the engine, which is slowing down the RPM. But it's bringing up my manifold pressure. So watch this. I'm at max thr throttle, and I'm going to bring down my propeller. My propeller is bringing down my manifold pressure. And my manifold pressure is reading engine value 1 off the module engine. So something is blowing more air in there. I have to, I have to try to figure it out. So I might put a pressure gauge in there, but um, I have to figure something out, some way to make that work. But anyways, manifold is screwed up. RPM's working as I want it. Let's check. Oh, we're actually doing pretty good speed here. Let me see. I was getting about 180 before. Let me bring up my propeller again. Okay, so RPM's working appropriately. Manifold is nuts, so I need to fix the manifold. Check my temps. So uh, let's look at our temps. So this one here is, is, is hotty. This one is hot. This one is okay, and this one is my superstar, so... I'll, I'll try to figure out a formula to work on manifold pressure, but if you look at this one, this is my buddy right here. This one runs cold, so I want to figure out why this one is my rock star and why this one runs cold. And so let's bring back, so we have full prop. Uh, I'd want to bring back manifold pressure. So you know what? It actually probably about, I don't know, maybe the manifold's not too bad. So let's try. Let's go to, no, that's kind of hairy. Let's go to... What's my max manifold? 115. Let me. I'm gonna just take some notes here. Um, I might be able to fake this all right, actually. 115. I just need to index it correctly. Check my temp. Start backing down on my on my power. My prop is set. I can just vary my power now. So let's go down to, yeah, these numbers are, are kind of hokey for me. I don't know, I'll figure it out. That's not bad there. What, we drop in temp. We're still gaining temp. Let's try to get a drop, and I want to see where I'm at here. Because next thing I want to go into is some other stuff on this. I'm going to take a break on manifold pressure. Okay, so we're dropping temp. I'm going to try to get us right to where I drop temp. So probably there is my critical power setting. So at 34 manifold pressure. So, yeah, so I, get, I need to figure this out. I want to make these look pretty realistic, so I need to kind of work with these. So whatever I'm reading manifold is not working. I'll figure that out later. That's not a big deal. Um, 45. Let's go back to the airport. Um, ooh, so let me see. I, I can, uh, let's navigate via my system. So let's bring in... For those of you who didn't see my system, I made a realistic ADF, so I have FJ Warner's channel 630 
Uh, so this is screwed up at the moment. I need to fix it. Um, that's on the to-do list. So let's go ahead and go to radio 650. Uh, 630 is FJ. 1, 2, 3. 630 is FJ. And that's reading a bearing of 299. Heading radio. Let's see if this turns me to 299. I'm going to power up just a hair. How are we reading on battery and volts? Volts is reading... Volts is reading. I just need to boost that number. Because that will never read if it's that low. Okay, see, my generators are all pit controlled. That's running nicely. Um, it could go off fuel flaws. Just, you know, initially I was trying to do it realistically getting an air... So, if you look at the... Can I walk in that wing without getting blown away by the wind? Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is this is not taking me to where I want. I want to go 295, so I need to go 295 in the heading hold, 295. Okay, that's going to go. I need to work in the uh, bearing system. Could go a fuel flow. What, so what I want to do is I'm not getting the correct numbers, so... The way that the supercharging works in game is it's say you're say you're putting in a max value of one to your uh, air manifold. The supercharger is blowing it and it's essentially adding that air on top. So let's say it's giving you 0.67 air. Um, I'm, this, this is what Triton does. And so it's adding it. So it's giving you a 1.67. That's what I was hoping because that would actually give me a true airflow value that's not jittering all over the place. Um, and has consistent flow rate. I need that number, but I don't know how to get that number. So that's the issue. Um, let's see. How far are we? 18 miles, 9 minutes. Um, I'm not going to make us go all the way back. Let's yank, let's yank it. We're way up here. All right. So let's take a break on manifold pressure. I'll figure that out later. I'll do some testing on that. Let's get some other stuff fixed. So let's go ahead and save this off. So this is getting there. RPM backup. Um, next thing I wanted to do was I need to fix my nav system. So I've kind of come up with what I want to do. And I need to sit in it for a second, spawn to see what I need to do. So I should have just done it in the air. But whatever, I'll do it right here. All right. So I, I've I've kind of thought about how I want to do this. I want to do it realistically how we had our, na uh, we had our nav system. So currently I have my autopilot master button. My master button. So let's say what I could do is I could set my heading. Hold, I could set my altitude hold while I'm sitting on the ground. As soon as I take off, I click AP master, and then we go to it. And so what I need here is this here. You see it's running three feet, three, five, six. So what that's doing is that's giving me a bearing to the zero, zero position. As you can see, zero, zero, it's giving me where the zero, zero position, zero, zero position, the map is 14 miles away. If I put in, so um, for those who haven't seen, I made an ADF add-on that I'm using. Where is it? Okay, maybe. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong game. Okay, that's why. I'm in the wrong save. There's no ADF in this save, um, so that's not going to work. Um, let's go ahead and pull this. Let's open up my other save here. Let's see. Did I save you? I think I saved you. Let me double check and save again. All right, so let's open up the save. Uh, Yeah. Manifold pressure. See, the, the thing is manifold pressure. So when you fly in a complex aircraft, you want to, so let's say you do takeoff, right? So you go uh, mixture prop throttle all the way to the firewall. As soon as you get off the ground, you do what's generally, uh, usually around 500 feet, you do what's called 25 squared. So you'd bring, uh, not on every airplane, but on the, you know, say the Piper Seminole, the Piper Arrow, you do 25 squared. So 25 squared was... Uh, 25 inches of mercury and 2,500 RPM. So you would first set you. So you would set your um, throttle. You bring your throttle back. That sets. Um, no, it's prop throttle. Prop throttle on climb. I think. Yeah, prop throttle on climb. So as you're going up, you want to bring your prop back. So you bring 
No, it's throttle prop. So you bring your throttle back. You set your throttle back to 25 inches of mercury. That limits your power of your engine. Then you bring back your propeller. Your propeller would set your RPM to 2,500 RPM. Uh, as you're descending, you do it opposite. You go throttle prop, and you change it that way. Why are you not opening the freaking door? Come on. Uh, let's see. So now we have, if you look over here, this is my ADF shack for my navigation system. So this is actually reporting its position. I have these all over the world, and it allows me to realistically navigate all the way up to Tajan and all around everywhere. So this here is what we're going to test with. And so I need to fix it. So I need to fix my fix Proteus to work uh, properly. All right, so let's go ahead and spawn it. I need to look at my autopilot panel so that I know what I'm doing. All right, so let's go Masters, Avionics. All right, so we have the Autopilot Master. That does what I said that, you know, without this, none of the modes work. Uh, so, like, I could do heading hold, altitude hold. It does nothing. As soon as I go Autopilot Master, if I'm ready to land, all I have to do is click Autopilot Master. It shuts off. It's the master that controls all autopilot systems. Station keeping is a helicopter thing. That position holds it. I don't need that on an airplane. It can monitor the bearing, and it will do a hold naturally. don't need that. I have two here that were intended that are going to change. One is heading radio. All that really did was it switched this from running off the GPS to running off of the um, frequency that's in here. Heading bearing switches us from heading hold to actually following the bearing. So this is going to change. This is going to default to read the radio. And right now it defaults to reading the GPS. Now this is an old or simulating an old older era aircraft. I want it to default to nav first and then uh, radio or GPS. So what I want to do is I want to have a GPS button here. And so what this will do is I'll click the GPS and all that's going to do is say, hey, read GPS instead of nav, instead of the nav frequency in there. And then I want a nav button and that's going to, instead of sending me to heading hold, it's going to send me to nav. And so I think that's what I'm going to do. I, I have an extra space too. So what I could do is put nav so I think that's what it'll do. Right here, station keeping is going to be nav. Um, this is going to go, one of these is going to be um, radio, and one of these is going to be uh, GPS. So it would be R, G, S, K. Okay, so that's where I'm at. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've kind of decided what I want to do here. So let's uh, get in there. So easiest way to find this is going to be video connection here. You go here to Autopilot AP Monitor. Okay, good. So I need to go in the Lua here, and I'm not great with Lua, but I know enough to be dangerous. All right, so let's get in there. So you, are, AP is good. Station keeping is now going to be nav. Will that fit in there? Probably not. Okay, nav. Heading radio is going to be radio. I'll just keep it simple. You're going to be heading bearing is going to be GPS. GPS. Okay, I have these all written down, the channels. Of course, I turned the page in my notebook, so that's going to be ugly. Nope, look at that. Found on the first flip. Damn. It's, it's good to be a gangster. Um, all right, so let's see. I'm going to reset these. So we have HR is now... I haven't changed the bottom one, luckily, because I forgot already. HR is, where are you? HR is R, radio. Let's actually do, yeah, let's do R for HR. Uh, R is HR. Heading, barrio, heading bearing is now GPS. Station keeping is now uh, nav. All right, so that's, we're in business. Let me fix this. R goes to R. Uh, nav, nav. G is now G. Okay, and so I know my freaks, so we're good. So that should hopefully be fine. Okay, so that's good. 
So let's update that. Now I need to go to my bearing panel, which should be there. I put them in logical places. Imagine that. All right, so um, if anyone doesn't know how this works, uh, it's kind of a refresher. So those those radio antennas that are broadcasting, all they're broadcasting is their GPS position. So what they're doing is they're reading out the X and Y coordinates of their GPS. You take your X coordinate from your, uh, say, your GPS or your radio receiver GPS, and then you compare it to the X coordinates of your aircraft. So it's taking X um it's taken the x of the gps and it's taken the x of your receiver and it's subtracting them then it comes into here it's doing um this nice business and it's giving you a bearing to the station so pretty simple and so let's go ahead i need to re screw with this to make this work right so this is all compact and annoying um so essentially the way this works is this is my radio receiver here, channel 1 and 2. That reads off the X coordinate. That reads off the Y coordinate. It's coming into a numerical switch box here. And so what I want to do is I'm going to double switch box these. Um, yeah, I'm going to just do switch boxes. I know you can do it in functions, but I'm going to do them in switch boxes. Um, it's just a little easier to do the hierarchy. So let's go ahead and do this. So I want this to default to zero unless I want it to do otherwise. All right, so I want this to start with a zero value. So zero value is in. Next, I want it to then go to now. Uh, no, how do I think of this? I'm trying to think, is there anything I want to do in that autopilot? Uh, let's see. Okay, so if it's not, if neither of those set, we'll get a zero. If one is set, okay, that's how I'm going to do Okay, so. So we're going to do an or not. So I'm going to work out the logic over here where it's clean and I'm not pulling my hair out. Um, nope, that's fine. We don't need that. Okay. How to do this? Um. I think the best way to do this here. I might just do it default. I'm overcomplicating this. I'm trying not to. Let's let's just do this for now. So I want to default my radio, so I just need to flip these. So one now goes um here, this one goes there. Okay, that's done. And so all I'm doing is I want my I want my radio frequency to read first, and then I want my okay, I'm just reading the chat a little bit. Yeah, I'll work on that manifold later. I'm just gonna look at it with some fresh eyes. So this is gonna switch there, and then keypad goes here. And so what this is gonna allow me to do is. Where the hell is keypad Y? A keypad, where's keypad X? Keypad X right here. Okay, so I flip these. All right, so that will be fine. Then what I want to switch these is composite 10. Okay, composite 10 is... Um, let me look at my panel again. See, I have station keeping, which I don't need anymore. So I need to kind of, I'm going to rethink this. I'm retweaking this again. And um, right now I have an empty slot on my autopilot, which isn't a bad thing. And I can fill it later when I figure out something else I want to do. So nav reads too many letters, which is fine. I'm going to, I can switch that to an N. So we have, um, so it's going to default radio so nav is fine where it is it just needs to switch to an n g is going to switch us to gps so it's going to default to read the radio and then so what i need to do is click g will then uh switch us to gps and um then i want to press nav will actually take us to nav and so you kind of want to set these up in where they should be so for example um you want um, nav to 
be by heading hold. So you can switch easily, click from heading hold right to nav, and then from nav to heading hold. That's how you want to set that up. So that's good. Um, that's fine. I just need to switch that. So nav is going to be 11. A GPS is fine where it is. That's 12. I just need to change some numbers. Okay, so that's fine. A lot of this is human factor stuff. You want to set things up in the correct position. Like old airplanes were absolutely brutal, like gauges everywhere. And they were just like, not, a lot of things weren't logical. And that caused a lot of accidents because you act like in a rush, in a panic, you'd reach and you'd tap the wrong thing and it would get you killed. Okay, there's nav right there. Uh, G is fine. R is going to be... Uh, blank for now. So I'm just going to put a blank in there just to so I don't confuse myself. All right, and then I need to do some re re um, some stuff. This this can be done now, I think. What do we got here? What is 10? 10 is HR. This was causing me problems before. Um, all right, so this can go. That was causing me problems before. I don't want that. Desired heading. This here is 12. 12 is heading. Uh, nope. 12 is now GPS. Okay, so what is heading hold? Heading holds 13. Where is my 13? So desired heading comes through. All right, so I kind of, I want heading hold to take ultimate precedence. Let's see. I'm trying to think how to set this up. So heading hold should always be the most important thing. Heading hold, so um, heading hold should be the most important one. So that should be last in order. So heading hold is going to be 13. And that runs off of here. So that's fine. This can come in here. And that can run to there. This will be 13. So heading hold needs to be my last step. It's always the most important. So I can't change heading until I click off heading hold. So this allows me to, so like we used to do this in the airline. So say you're going to do an ILS approach, right? You do an approach to landing. The thing you get before an approach to landing is called vectors. They say, you know, Eagle Flight 276, turn right, heading to 250, expect the runway ILS uh, 30. And so you turn to 250, you now have about a 45, 50 degree um, inbound course to the 300 uh, ILS. And so then what you do is you'd be on heading. And then as you start to get close to the nav and you start to see your needle coming in for your uh, ILS, you then deselect heading hold and your nav would be pre-selected and it would automatically grab the course. So we want heading hold last. And then if we're on nav and we want to switch to heading hold, what this allows me to do is I can punch a heading in and then I can track my nav and then at the last second all I have to do is press heading hold and it prioritizes heading hold. So that's what I want. So that goes there. That is correct. Um, then what I want to do is you no longer work in here. So you should actually be here. Yep. That goes there. This goes bye bye This goes bye bye Okay, so that controls this. So that is actually pretty good. That's all right. Um, we're in good shape there. So now I have heading. I have this bearing micro. Now, if I go into my bearing micro... I have two options. I can read the radio frequency or I can read the GPS. And so right now I switch the hierarchy up. So I'm going to start with radio and then I'm going to go to GPS. So that's set in already. I just did that. Now what I need to control is this, which is the um, frequency to change to GPS. This changes to 12. All right, so this is when I want GPS, it's going to swap this over. That's keypad X. Yep, swaps that over. That's keypad Y. That swaps that over. That's composite 2, which is Y. That's good. That's composite um, 1, which is X. That's good. So that runs. So let's go ahead and do a test. Um, this should cross your fingers work. All right, so one of the ways we can read this is with our ADF needle. Let me control... Um, daylight so we can see something. 
I shut the lights off in here because any any lightly colored aircraft, when the in-game lights hit it, it halos it really badly. All right, so let's start with our um, G, N for nav. Beautiful. Okay, we're in good shape there. So if we look over here, we have our shack. Our shack is going to read its GPS coordinates to our radio antenna, which is in our tail uh, right about there. And that's then going to read the information in, and it's going to give us a heading. So right now it's reading 356. That is the center point of the map. It's given us the 00, zero position of the map. It's 14 miles away. Now, if I go over here and I type in 630, which is the frequency of that ADF that I just flew over to, we should be able to switch back. You notice the needle moved? Watch this. Let's go back to 00. zero. So 00, zero just reads nothing. See where that's pointing? Now I type in 630, which is the frequency. 600 is actually one, another station. So see where the needle's pointing? It's pointing to the shack that's sitting right over there. Now if I switch pages, we're with, see how it's, it's flashing? We're within one mile. It's a heading of one of 100. So if I look over here, if I had a compass on me, that would show 100. All right. And we can back this up with GPS. So let's go ahead and stick a GPS in front of us. Where are we at here? All right. So right in front of the shack, I want to put a GPS. And I can see it it's sitting right in front of us. So now this needle should go from pointing at the shack to pointing directly there. And as you can see, we're uh, 259 meters away. So if I go in here and I enter in my waypoint, and then I click G, 162, 162. See, we're 65, a couple degrees left, 162. And you notice the needle is now pointing directly ahead of us. So now we've switched to GPS. If I take off GPS, needle should shoot to the left, looking at that station. Needle shoots left, shooting at that station. So that is fixed and that's working. So now what I want to do is um, let's check our autopilot. So autopilot. So let's go ahead and put our heading hold in. Let's go 165. That's the heading ahead of us. 165. All right. So uh, if I go autopilot on, heading hold, you'll notice our rudder should be straight. Straight rudder. Now if I go to nav, it should do nothing. Still straight rudder. As soon as I take off my heading hold, uh, should be giving me a rudder turn. I don't know why it's not. Let me see. Is it going the wrong way? It might be. Let, let me see. It, it's moving a small degree. Let's see if it's going the right direction. That should be turning us. Let me see what's up with this rudder. This is how I'm testing the autopilot. I, I just don't want to have to fly for it. Um, come on. Give me the rudder. Stand on stuff to try to get. There we go. It is moving, but I don't think it's moving enough to work. So let's see. Why are you not turning on nav? All right. I don't think the nav's working. Let me check. Um, we'll do a heading hold here. So let's do a heading hold of... Oh, I don't know. Uh, 100. That's where the station is. 101. Let's make sure my rudder is not turning. That's not. Let's go ahead and click heading hold. It should turn us. And you see the rudder turn. So that's what the rudder should have looked like when I click nav. It's not. So I got to figure out why it's not doing that. So nav should keep it there. Uh, if that's all, you know, because it's 101. I'm putting, you know, 100 essentially 101. So let's go ahead and see what's up with that. And why that isn't working. So that would be in the autopilot section. So bearing should be reading out on channel 32. So where are we at here? This here should read out on 32. As you can see, channel 32 reads out this bearing 2. That should read 32. That should come down here to bearing micro out. What are you reading? Oh, you're our needle. So this reads just our needle. That reads channel 32. Bearing micro out. So bearing micro out, as you can see, goes to a lot of me talking through this. So I remember bearing micro out, which comes in autopilot, bearing micro. Where are you at there, guy? Uh, bearing micro. Where are you at there, Johnny? Bearing micro. Should be down here. Uh, bearing micro. Bearing micro should read channel 32. 
Okay, I screwed this up. Nope, did I? 13. I did screw this up. Okay. Should be like that, I think. Let me double check it. I'll talk through it. Uh, so heading, desired heading should be our default setting. What is 13? 13 is heading hold. Nope. Okay. I want to double stack these, I think. Do I? Do I? Do I? Do I? Heading hold. Um, okay, so. No, I had it right. Um, yeah, that's, I'm trying to think how this, how to make this work right, how I want it to work. Just trying to figure out how how I want this. I'm trying to think of all the all the different permutations of how you'd be flying and when you'd want to change things. So that's kind of uh, interesting. So we have bearing micro. So I want it to read nothing. Um, let's see. I don't want it to do anything until I put in a heading. So that switches it so that it, um, I, I could do double numerical switch boxes, I think what I should do. Let's go back to duplicate numerical switch boxes. Okay. And then, so I want heading hold there. And then I want this to be here and I want a zero value if I have nothing in there. Okay, so let's see. That should switch that. And then, yep, so I'm, I'm back to where I was. That's fine. That's how I want it. And then I want Lua script AP monitor. That's fine. So let's go there. Okay, so that's that's what I want. Um, is it though? Crap, crap, crap. I'm trying to think of the best way to set this up. Okay, this is when I wanted to put in a nav. So let's figure something out. Um, so I have that blank now. Okay, so this was supposed to be nav. Yeah, I okay, I did forget something. So 11. I did forget something. I already set this up, but I just forgot to do it. So 11 should go here and switch us to some form of navigation. We need to actually click the button to get heading. So I want it to do nothing um, if I don't if I don't enter anything in. This goes up here. Okay, so that's going to work right. So that goes there. Okay. All right. Let's test this again. So I was trying to make it work that way, and then it wasn't behaving. All right. So let's go ahead and click it on. Um, so right now, the autopilot, let's click the autopilot on. It should be doing nothing. It's doing nothing. Okay. Heading hold. Let's put in a heading hold of... 101, which is our bearing to our radio. All right, 101, bearing to our radio. Should be doing nothing. It's doing nothing. Let's go ahead and click heading hold. Should now go to the left. It now goes to the left. Bingo, that works. Take it off. Should go back to center. Centered. Perfect. Okay. Uh, this reading zero position on the map. I want to go... Um, Let's put in our freak. Because this would automatically track me to the station without me wanting it to. Okay, so that's reading 630. That's good. Now I want to click nav. And it should, uh, see now we have a straight rudder. Hopefully clicking nav should take me there. Do I need to click GPS too? That would be a screwy mess. Okay, so I need to click G. Yes. All right, let's go. All right, so nav should be here. Let's go ahead. So, okay, so this actually might not be too far off. So see how it's turned? Let's go ahead and click off GPS and hopefully this straightens that tail back up. It does, perfect. So this actually works all right. So nav allows me to either read the radio or the GPS. Um, what I need to do is then put in, um, so that will read nothing until I select a radio mode. So that's actually good. So I'm going to put R for radio up here. 
All right, so we're making progress. I'm just trying to think through, because I have to think of like what to do on an approach to make the approaches work. So I'm kind of doing some work in my head to get this kind of racked up, ramped up here. So these need to be double switch boxed as well. So that will get me set up where I want to be. So let me start cleaning this up. So this needs to go out here. All right, and so there's a little bit of a messy mess here, but um, this is all connected where, it want, where I want it. This here needs to go, so you here are going to be, you now go here. All right. And then you, so what's that? That is my radio. This is radio two here. So radio two now goes here. And then you go to there and you go to where that one went. Okay, so these are double switch boxed. That will now give me the f uh, the functionality I want. Okay. All right, and that's going there. That's fine. That's fine. So these are keypads can go here and here. All right, so we're making progress on this. I'm just trying to get this set up, and I have to think about how to do this on approach, how to get the autopilot to work exactly how I want. So the GPS functions can then come up here. That's fine. GPS coordinates can come there. That's cleaning this up, making this so I can actually tell what the hell I'm doing. Inputs, those are fine. All right, so we're good. Um, this will read nothing until I switch over to nav. All right, good. And so where's my switch? My switch here is 12. So 12 currently is my GPS. So 12 is going to switch me from now is going to switch me from radio to GPS. I need to read radio, which is now going to be what used to be HR, which is 10. So I need to grab another one of these. You are now 10. All right, so I got this figured out. So we actually did need all the slots to make this work right. See, I don't want the autopilot to do anything that I'm not commanding it to do. That's very important. Autopilot should not be doing anything uncommanded. So it's going to read zero values and essentially be dead and dumb until I make it do something. And that makes it function the way I want to and doesn't cause me issues. So let's go ahead and that should work. So 10 is going to be my radio. So what I'm going to do is let's say I'm flying along, flying along. Um, they give me a vector. I want to do radio. I have to click radio to switch this from nothing to radio. It's now going to read my radio through. And then when I click nav, it's going to switch me from tracking on my heading that I put in to tracking the nav. If I want to then switch to GPS, I click the G and it will switch from radio to GPS. So we're in business here. I think we're good. I need to do one quick Lua fix on the autopilot panel. And let's go ahead and get in there. All right, so the dash is now getting switched to R for radio. Radio. Okay, so we have our radio. We have our nav, which either is we want to track via radio or track via GPS. We have our GPS to select GPS. Okay, we have heading hold. And there's better ways I can do it than switch boxes. I'll change that out later. I just want this functioning well, and then I can clean it up later. All right, so let's do the test. All right, let's test this up. All right, so we are currently going to throw a heading of 101 in there, 101. All right, so this should do nothing. Autopilot master is on. Rudder does nothing. Click HH. We should have a rudder to the left, rudder to the left. All right, good. I should click that off. It should recenter. Recenter is nothing. Okay, good. Now I want to go in here and I want to put in 630, which is at a 101 heading. 630. Okay, let's go back to our radio page. Okay, you're not reading correctly now, so I need to see what's up with that. That's screwy. So let's fix that. So that should be reading over there. It's not. So it's still reading zero. So that is not doing its job. Oh. I need to press radio, 101, bingo. Now that goes over there. Tail should be straight. Nope, tail is 
cockeyed. Um, so nav is not working. Okay, so I need to make it uh, nav and radio, nav and GPS. Let's do that. All right, nav is going to be what? What are you on nav? Nav is eleven. Okay, so now I've I've kind of figured out where I'm at, what I want. All right, so if it gives me, that's bearing micro. That's eleven is nav. Was it not? I thought it was function right. Let me see. That's either going to read GPS or radio until I swap it with eleven. That should work. It should be working. Let me double check it. I'll see why it's not working. Should work because that there should kill the signal. Might have just done something wrong. Let's see. Um. Put in 6.30 here. This just loops. 6.30. All right, it's going to read 3.56 until I click radio. 101. All right, now we have GPS straight ahead of us. That should read about a 162. Let's put that in. Should not change until I hit GPS. 162. Bingo, bango, bongo. Uh, rudder should be straight. Rudder is cockeyed. Why is rudder cockeyed? That's the question. Why are you reading a cockeyed rudder? That's the question. Why is it trying to turn me? Trying to figure this out. Should not be reading to anything. Take that off. The rudder straightens out. That's a problem. Okay, so I need to figure out what the hell is up with that. That should be reading a zero for my rudder. We go into autopilot, see why that is commanding that. So that's me screwing something up with the hierarchy. That should be this here. So this should be reading a zero. Hmm. This is reading. This is a zero. Till I press nav, it should no, should be sending a zero through to my autopilot system. Why is that turning me when that is on there? 11 is, I keep hitting my mic, sorry. 9, 10, 11. 11 is nav. So until I press nav, I should be putting a zero signal through. I'm confused. This is 13. This does not matter. Until I put a signal through, this should not be doing anything. See, this should be reading the zero value until I press nav. Very interesting. And then channel 32. Let me check the bearing here. Did I put 11 in here? I might have put 11 in here. Nope, 10. What is 10? 10 is radio that's fine that's switching from zero to radio 12 12 is gps 12 is gps what is causing this to read a not a zero signal all right let's go test it in the air i'll make try to make this um figure this out put it through a real life application and we'll see how if it behaves if it misbehaves and then i can figure it out a little bit better i think And I'm, I need crossfeed. I'm in my actual save world. I don't have a ton of fuel, so I need to crossfeed us here. Let's take break off. Let's start pushing forward. Let's do our tail. Go 20. Should be able to take off in the intersection, hopefully. I, I can run on that dirt if I need to. I'm just trying to save some time. All right, so let's set up for takeoff. So takeoff heading is 078 is runway heading. Let's go up, climb and maintain 1,000 feet. All right, we'll pre-select H. We'll pre-select um, 
altitude hold. Rudder should do nothing. Okay, we're ready for takeoff. Let's do a takeoff checklist. Flaps are set. Prop is set. Lights, beacon, nav, strobes. All right, and we'll do tail is up. Tail is up. That's going to go on the takeoff checklist, too. Let's get out there. Let's take off. You guys are awfully quiet in the chat. So I make sure you're still there. All right, we're actually steering all right. Um, this, the tail, the, the, the tail wheel is annoying in game because once you get past 45, I'd rather drag the wheel than turn you. Um, it's actually not doing too bad now. All right, let's take do an intersection departure. So takeoff checklist complete. Um, we'll do uh, taxi land takeoff uh, landing lights. All right, let's let's blow here. Oh yeah, we have plenty of runway. Take off. This sucker has just got so much lift with that big old wing. Pause the rate. Gears coming up. In this plane, we'll do above 90 knots. Put flaps up. All right, above 100. What is going on with my manifold pressure? Oh, uh, you know what? I killed my left engines. There we go. That could have been ugly. Crossfeed. I need to fix my crossfeed. My crossfeed's a pain in the AS at the moment. You know what I could do if both buttons are on? It auto crossfeeds. Maybe I'll do something like that. I could also change. These are super duper fast. But um, the other thing I was thinking of doing is if, we're, if they're within 10 pounds. See, what I'm going to do is this is going to be an enunciator panel. And enunciators will pop up if you have low fuel, if you have an engine fire, if you have um, emergency fuel. It pops up all these messages. That's what this panel is going to be. I just have yet to get to it. So, like, it's going to tell me crossfeed, fuel imbalance. And then I'll know to stop my crossfeed. All right, so we're good. We're climbing up. Um, let's go ahead and set autopilot. That's why I put those in is so that it automatically takes over when I take off. All right, so heading, it should keep our heading no matter what until I take the heading hold off. So I can select my other modes, and it won't do it until I go there. So let's go ahead and put in my, um, let's actually find a further away place. So let's navigate to the military base. There's a beacon at the military base. The, the military beacon is 600. So if I put in 600 in here, 600, this should still read 345. Uh, Let's go ahead and put in um, radio, 300. All right, so we're still doing 77. Let's click nav. We should still be doing 77. If I take off heading hold, we should be going to it. Okay, so that's actually working exactly how I want it. That's fine. It was just be in the hangar. It was being a little... Let's see. Oh, you're working on your F4? Yeah. All right, so we're turning to the military base. Let me set a... I'm going to put a waypoint marker on the military base. That way I can easily see it. Excuse me if I gulp. I'm drinking my coffee. Next thing I want to get into is that, remember if I was telling you, this was my sweetheart for cooling, so I need to see why that cools so much better. See, turning perfectly to there, that should maintain our heading right to the military base. So this is working how I want it. All right, next step. Um, you see the, see where that waypoint is? I'm going to move it. I'm going to move it just to the right. Set waypoint. And then that's over there. Now what I want to do is I want to enter in that GPS coordinate. Okay, we should not go to it. Until I click uh, GPS, now we should go to it. All right, now if I unselect GPS, we should go back to the military base. So let's go ahead and unselect it. We should head back to military base. Gorgeous. So this works out. And so the reason you need this is, so let's talk about how an instrument approach works. All right, so I made an instrument approach. Let me see if I can bring it up. See, I should bring it up in paint. I'll bring it up in paint. That way I can uh, edit it and show you guys. So this this is one of the things I really find fun in game, and I like sharing my knowledge. You know, I, I I miss you know I miss certain elements of being a flight instructor, and that was something that I really loved to do. And so it was um, 
you know, so kind of teaching people how to fly was fun, and so that's why I kind of got into that and got into the um, captain's flight school. So if we look here at my approach plate, so I made this approach plate for the military base, and so this is how an ADF approach works. And so what you do is the needle is, so my station is right here, right next to the, um, let me get a color here, red, let's go. So right here, my uh, little my little station is right here on the field. So we're, we're going directly to the shack there. What we want to do is we want to track outbound on a 030 course outbound. And so I should put an arrow in here. I need to make, uh, redo the approach plate, but arrow we want to track out here. We want to go out for four nautical miles. So we go out. I can read the distance to the station. When we hit four nautical miles, we want to turn out on a three, four, five heading. So that's three, four, five. And then we want to go out for, uh, let's say, uh, we're too fast. We're, we're fast. So we don't want to cut this in too much. So let's say, let's go out for another four miles. Um, and so we'll go out for four miles. Then we want to go inbound. So we'll take a right turn. So we'll go right. And we'll go inbound on a 165. And when we, when we, when our needle reads 210, then we want to come in on the 210 course inbound to the station. So let's actually do this approach. Um, and that will get us where we need to be. Let me check my messages really quick. Who's messaging me? Okay, I see it there. All right. Um, sorry, I got 9,000 windows open at the moment. I got to get to you, back to you guys. All right, so um, this is the instrument approach. So I think this is going to be best. So let's um, let's not cheat, <laughs> okay? Right now, I'm a cheating. So let's not cheat. Uh, one thing you do when you do an instrument training is you wear uh, what's called a hood. It uh, blocks your vision. So you put it on your top of your head, and what it does is it blocks all of the windows and so all you can see is your gauges so instead what i did i socked us in in the fog now if you look at the tracks down there i can still see enough tracks that i should be able to see my runway lights to land so right now we're headed to the military base when I, when this light flashes when i get within half a mile now we need to let me check my temps fuel fuel i need to bank some fuel in this tank um, when I get within a half a mile of my station, this will flash. I need to change that. Um, this was on Katie did. Katie did doesn't go that fast. So I need to change this. I also need to put some decimal places back in here. This needs a decimal place. Uh, this needs a decimal place. Anyway, so we're five miles out. We're five minutes out. We're nine nautical miles away from the station. And so what we want to do is we want to head out. When we get when that light comes on, I essentially want to turn. So let's bring back up the approach plate. So um, we're gonna come in, and we're coming in. Let me check my heading. So we're heading about a two nine five. So two nine five. We're coming in right about here. So let's look at our approach plate again. So we are coming in like this. So here is us. When we get within a half a mile, I'm gonna start to turn. And I want to join the 030 outbound course. The needle is actually going to point backwards behind us. Our number is going to read 030, and we're going to actually have to turn backwards. So if the number starts decreasing, we're going to turn. See, number starts decreasing. It's going this way. We need to turn left. Number decreases. We need to turn left to go bring it back to the right. So if this number decreases, we want to go left. If it increases, we want to go right. We want to track the 030 outbound for four miles. When we hit four miles, I'm going to turn to a heading. All right, it's not a bearing. It doesn't have to be off anything. I'm going to turn to a heading. I'm going to turn to a heading of three, four, five. After four nautical miles, I'm going to turn around to a heading of one, six, five. I'm going to track that one, six, five heading back in for until my needle shows close to 210. Then I'm going to turn in. I'm going to track the 210 needle in. When I get within 1.7 nautical miles, I'm going to descend down to uh, 200 feet. That's actually 272 feet, field el elevation. I'm going to, at uh, 1.7 nautical miles, I'm going to descend down to 272 feet. I'm going to track that all the way inbound. Now, when I get to about here, I should see the, the airport. Now, we're actually tracking into the left side of the runway, or the right side of the runway, and so I need to jog to the left and land. So that's what we're doing. 
So you actually, you, um, let me check. I hope I'm not overheating here. Up, oh, up, oh, I, I did shit kill my engines, though. Which I knew I was going to do. And, you know, this crossfeed uh, is just fast. I didn't check it. All right, so that's uh, one thing you do when you're doing instrument approaches. You always want to brief the approach. And so that's what you do. You read it off like that. And that gets you set up. And so the reason why I just spent all that time screwing around with making sure these buttons worked in the precise way that I want is I need that information and I need to be able to control my aircraft in a certain way to make all of that work fluidly. And so I need to be able to select my nav, put in my next heading, then select my heading, switch back to nav. So I need to be able to constantly switch back and forth. So let's get this balanced up. All right, there we go. So we're balanced on fuel. Fuel cross feeds off. Uh, we're good now. All right, so we are presently um, three minutes out, five nautical miles. Let's check our temps. Temps are coming up, but they're good. This is still my rock star by a mile, dude. I have to, so I have to look at my cooling systems. I have these engines air cooled. Um, I'm doing them air cooled because that's how they'd be in real life. So I want them air cooled. I actually want to have to manage my temperature. People keep asking why I manually cross feed. It's to give me something to do. You know, the more things you have to do, the more engaged you are. You know, again, you know, I'm, I would say I'm at a different level than most people as I was a commercial pilot. So I'm, I'm used to setting up an approach, managing my fuel, managing my radios, talking to tower, doing all these different steps. And so for me, I don't need all this automated because, you know, this is what I used to do. So that's why I, um, that's why I like little jobs to do. Let's kill these lights. I don't need those on. All right, so I'm going to come up on prop. And I'm going to come down on power. Should have done power prop, but... All right, that's going to take off some of my heat here. Start stripping some heat. Prop at 100%, props at 100. Just getting the power down enough. Um, I actually want to slow down. You don't want to be screaming around on an approach. All you're doing is you're just eating up your time. Uh, the faster you go, the less time you have to set up, the less time you have to stabilize and do your descents and everything else. So I don't want to, I don't want, all I'm doing is robbing time for myself by going too fast. Everybody wants to go too fast sometimes and sometimes you need to slow down and kind of uh, you know it buys you time. Let me see. I'm using fluid to air. Yep. I have, uh, there's a ram scoop underneath uh, going to a pump. The pump goes through. That blows the air through. There's an air outflow valve or an air, air outflow uh, port, and it the air is cooling the liquid. So that's actually kind of how they'd run. They'd, they'd run uh, you know, a lot of these with either direct air cool fins or they'd run them uh, air liquids. So I'm running them air liquid cooled. Am I dropping temp? I am dropping temp. Okay, good. So we're set up 83 uh, knots, which is pretty good. Let's see. Oops. I just screwed us all up here. I'm right on top of it. I need to turn... Uh, 210. I'm sorry, 030. 030 heading. I almost screwed us up there. I'm going to be a little bit late here. I need to go more. Let's go. I'm going to anticipate. I'm going to go 50 degrees. So see this bearing? I screwed us up. I was... See how I'm curving around here? So let's go to... Uh, let's go to 60 Check my speed. Speed's getting slow. I need to increase my power a little bit. All right, there we go. Uh, temp should be fine. All right, so if we look really quick, I'm going to have to do super duper quick here. Um, if we look at my approach plate, I was busy talking, and I hit the point, and I came around. So I'm going to come around. I have to do an intercept heading now to get out on that uh, 030. So what I'm looking for now is... Um, no, I'm sorry, 210. 210, now we want to turn 030. Because of an ADF, uh, if this was a VOR, I'd actually want to track the 030. I want to track the 210. So let's check it. 
Bingo. Oh my god, I hit it right in the nose. That's gorgeous. Uh, I got it perfect. All right, so if you look right there, see it's staying on 210. 210 means that my 030 is perfect. I can't believe I caught that. See how we're tracking perfectly out? We're perfectly out on the 030. Let's take a quick screenshot, and I'm going to pause this. And let's bring up paint. And so if you look, okay, now look at my, um, let me see if I can load it here. Um, three shots. See where I am? I, that was just sheer luck that I caught it that quick, and I was able to put us right on the zero three on the uh, two ten outbound course. So that's there. Sodium cooled engines. I don't know why that. I probably don't want to put sodium in there. Um, yeah, all the like turbines. You don't need anything. You have air cooled. Um, most most everything now modern day is is turbine. Like moonies, you probably have liquid cooled moonies. All right, so we're going out here. We want to go to a distance of four nautical miles. We're at three. All right, so doesn't this look like the approach plate? We're going out on that 030 course. It's the 210 because the needle actually wants to point behind us. It's the reciprocal of 030. When this hits four, I want to change my heading. Remember, my heading is going to be a 345. 345. So now I can put that in heading hold. Um, I don't want to do it yet. So when this hits four, we just hit four, three, four, five. And we're turning. All right, so now we're on this part of our approach. So we have hit four nautical miles. I'm turning out on the three, four, five. Okay. Now I'm going to go out. I can't do four nautical miles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my speed. I'm doing 100 knots. I'm doing about a mile and a half per minute. So we want, let's say, three minutes. So let's just look at my time. Three minutes. So I'm going to go about three minutes out. I could extend this as long as I want, so we'll go at three minutes. And when the time hits uh, 1910, I'm going to turn back inbound. So we're on a heading, okay? So this should, okay, heading hold is as is, is soon as, see how we're, do I have nav pre-primed, okay? So notice my nav is still set. As long as my heading hold is also highlighted, this nav will never follow the nav. And the reason I set that up that way in the autopilot is that what I want to happen is that, so if this is set as nav, right, when I, it, you know how last time I had to quickly throw in 030 to be able to track the course out? I don't have to do that this time. What happens is as I get close to this reading 210 when we come back in, all I have to do is deselect heading hold and the nav will automatically take me to the station. That's what I want. I'm actually going to want to track a heading, but, um, you know, I'll do that later. All right, so let's check the time. Let me see. I'm going to check the plan view here. So as you can see, we're headed out on this 45-degree course. We probably don't need to go for three minutes, uh, but I, I don't want to cut in. I don't want to cut in. You know, you see how big this approach is? That's about how big a real approach would be in real life. You know, people, they, they underestimate how small the game is compared to real life you know, and how much space you need for a big aircraft to do all the things you need. This is about how big an approach is. You see how much geography I'm, I'm taking up here. Um, I might cut this in a minute uh, pretty quick. Now, we're still going about a mile and a half a minute. So, um, you know, a little bit better than a mile and a half a minute. So, so much of aviation is quick arithmetic, understanding how fast you are, how quickly you have to make your decisions. You always want to stay ahead of the airplane, so it takes some time. Um, we get cleared the approach. Taxi light comes on to remind us that we're cleared the approach. Um, we have about probably 30 seconds before I want to turn in. So my inbound course is my reciprocal 345, which should be uh, 165. We can check the chart. 165 is my inbound course. And so I'm going to get ready to set that in. 165, 165. And as soon as uh, 1910 hits on my time, I'm going to click it, and I'm going to turn inbound. We'll do a right turn and inbound course of 165. Right now, we ignore the needle. Needle's not doing anything for us. We don't care where the station is. This is all we're giving ourselves vectors based on the, um, based on the approach plate. There's 10. Clicking it in, we're making our right turn. Now, 
when this number gets close to 210, all right, let's go back to our approach plate. So what are we doing? We're coming, we're making our turn back in. So we are way up here, we're making this turn inbound right now. We're gonna track the 165 heading in. That number will, the arrow will always point at the station. Now is this, it's gonna move, it's gonna move, it's gonna move. Now as, it, as we get to this line here, that line is gonna read 210. So as we get close to 210, now if we waited to 210, we'd overshoot it. So we need to estimate, we need to come in early and track the 210 in. All right, so we're watching this number. So we are headed now 165, so we're, uh, we're, so we're still turning. So we're close. We're gonna be on our inbound leg here in a second. So remember, we went out for about three minutes. Um, we wanna, it will take us about three minutes to come back in. Now watch this number, this number will climb. See, it's climbing. So see where the needle's pointing? So the station is over there. Now as we move, as we move, right, that station's gonna get more and more and more and more and more like this. And when it's 210, we turn in. So this number will keep climbing. So now, one thing we can do is to kind of estimate our turn. Let me check fuel. All right, to estimate our turn, I'm gonna watch how fast this needle, this number comes in. You notice it's coming in nice and slow. So I'm only a 45 degree turn from my um, course. So let's say at 200, I want to track inbound. Now that might be too early. It might be too late. I'm not sure. I don't know how long it's going to take this aircraft to turn. So at 200, I'm going to deselect heading hold and it's going to track me straight to the nav. Now, if that doesn't keep me on the 210, if like say I'm at 208, I need to turn more to the left. And so what I would go is I would put um, two, say 12 in here, go back to heading and track it in. And then I go back to nav. And so that's why I had this, that's why I spent so much time setting up the hierarchy is I need to be able to have both these selected and then deselect heading hold and have it take me where I wanna go. I wanna be able to switch from GPS to radio separately. And so that's very important is having that set up checking fuel always checking fuel while you're flying so the enunciator panel the way this is going to work is there's going to be a bunch of messages with lua and so if i let's say i get low on fuel 30 minutes or less um actually um let's see i ifr for instrument flight rules you're required to have um oh this remind it's it's tough should be an hour fuel extra to go from your initial landing point. Uh, you need like an hour's fuel so that you can go, it's actually an hour to your alternate, something like that. So maybe if I have an hour's fuel left, uh, I don't want it that low. I don't know. I'm thinking, you know, the, the distances in game are pretty short. I might do an hour's fuel. I'm watching this. Uh, so we're, we're just watching this. I don't care about the time anymore. Remember, we timed for three minutes out. I don't care about that. What I care about is this number. This number is king. If I sped up, this number would come in faster. If I slowed down, this number would increase slower. As soon as that hits 200, heading hole comes off. We track in on the nav. So we're almost there. Getting ready, heading hold. 200, nav comes off. Now, heading hold, nav's coming off. We're within... Uh, once we come within 1.7 nautical miles, which I'm actually gonna, um, we're gonna hit, we're gonna do that too fast. All right, so watch this. If that number stays on 201, okay, we don't want that now. So what I want to do is I want to go to 212, uh, 212, and so I'm gonna go back. So I need to, I turn too quickly, so. This number should keep increasing until we get there. I need to descend really quickly, 200. Probably should have descended earlier. Let's slow down here. I want to start slowing down. Flaps are coming in. I need to get ready for landing. Gear's coming down. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Speed, 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 speed. This aircraft is pretty docile. I, can, I need to de decrease my prop. Prop's coming all the way back to give me... Um, I'm just checking my speed here. All right, I'm doing like 12 things at once here. See, I'm only two miles out. I need to descend. What's my heading? 198. Ooh, crap. All right, I, I overshot. Let's go back to nav. Um, 
Alright, I, I got way too distracted here. I'm, I'm getting slow as well, so I'm having a... I'm having a play with everything at once, so... It's gonna, it's gonna be, uh, uh... I'm not that far from it, so I, I have to lose... Okay, we're actually good on altitude. Altitude's pretty good. We're actually doing alright here. Um, I'm tracking directly in nav. We're gonna be off. We may struggle to land here, but, um, see, I'm at the 196. I need that to increase, so let's go to 220 on the heading. So we're too far right of the course. So let me go back to paint. So what happened here was I cut in early, and then I tried correcting it. I didn't correct enough, so we're over here somewhere. We want to be over here, and we want to be heading directly in on this line. So we are cutting we are cutting the corner too much, and I need to fix that, but we're way too close. So um, I need to watch my speed. Speed is... We're still flying. This airplane can get very slow. All right, so I'm, I'm just watching everything. We're less than a mile away. We're, we're, we're getting close here. We're tracking in on the nav. 196. We should hopefully see it soon. Let me cheat. Okay, we're doing all right. We're, see, we're inside the course. So like I said, I could just tell by the numbers we're inside the course. Let's go 220. Let's uh, try to fix this course really quickly. I want this to get to 210. We have a little bit of time, but we don't have much. Luckily, I can get... I'm down to 63 knots, so uh, let's go back to nav. Okay, I was actually, shit, I was turning the wrong direction. That's my fault. I was turning the wrong direction. Oh, here it is, right here. There's the airport. All right, so what I want to do is autopilot's coming off. I want to go around. All right, so this is called a missed approach. When you screw up your approach, you do a miss. Look at that right there. See that? Let me uh, pause it. Uh, right here, where my cursor is, that is where the, see the little shack? So we track directly to the shack. So I'm going to do a visual approach here. Alright, so I screwed that up. I was turning my head in the wrong direction. So that was a me problem. But as you can see, even in this fog, we could find the airport and land. Now, because I turned the wrong direction, I screwed up my number. Uh, again, I was do trying to do too many things at once. But that would allow me to um, get right on the runway. And so if we had come in on the on the 210 course, which, like I said, I was cutting my corner too much. If we came in on the 210 course, I'll try to show you what that would look like really quick here. Um, so I'm going to make my final turn. So we would be just off to the right of the runway. I'm going to try to show you where we are. Oh, whoa, whoa, cutting it in too much here. Power, power, climb. We're fine on the altitude. The water just scared me when I saw it, so... Um, let me see. Roll out, roll out, guy. Roll out. There we go. It's foggy. Let me kill the fog so we can see here. All right, so runway's right there. So when we came in, we'd be coming in a little bit to our right here, and we'd break out in the fog like this, and we would continue in, and we'd actually be, f like, on the opposite side of the runway, and then we would just visually come in like this. And we would turn to the runway. We wouldn't be this extreme of a of a crank, but um, that's what I would end up doing to get us in there. But um, that was just me turning the wrong way, uh, you know, my heading hold. I need to modify this. Uh, I need brakes here. Modify. I need to modify my approach. Brakes, 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 brakes. Come on, give me some brakes. There we go. All right, so um, that worked fine. It was just me. It was me screwed up. Um so kind of let's let's recap here. So if you pull up the instrument approach, um, let's bring up a fresh one. All right, so this is what we did. Um, had some had some mistakes that were my own mistakes. I kept getting distracted, and so um, you want to aviate, navigate, communicate. I was communicating too much. We hit the station. We went past it. I had a perfect grab. I grabbed it perfectly, which was all luck. And I came perfectly out. At four nautical miles, we turned out. After three minutes, we turned back in. I cut the corner. I, I thought it was going to take us longer to turn than it did. And so I tracked in. I was tracking in the 202. So if you draw a line, right, this has an infinite number of radials. So this one here would be, so the station is actually here. So this line would extend all the way to the shack. And then if you drew a line from the shack directly to north, that would be 360, 360. Zero. That's a beautiful three there. 
uh, 360, we tracked in. We were coming in on the 202, and I turned the wrong direction. Uh, what I should have done is I should have turned more easterly, and I was turning more westerly, and so all I did was I cut us in even more. And so I was cutting us in too much to this side. What I meant to do is turn more this way to come back on the course, and what would have happened is it would align me directly with the runway. The runway is on a 210 heading, and so right about here, I would have seen the runway, and I would have been right, right off the right side of it. I would have been like the right there. And so I would have seen it, and then I would have visually been able to come in and land. So the approach worked great. It was just uh, my issue. Let me read the chat really quick. Let me, uh, let me just take down master volume so we're not hearing the props. Let's see. Where are we at here? Yeah, the, that's one of the reasons I use those heat exchangers is... Um, they don't get used. Everybody just goes right to five by fives or three by threes because they're the most efficient. I do it for RP, and also I want to manage my own heat. That gives me something to do. Yeah, the pretty much everything. The better the fuel flow. If you have stable fuel flow, they're cooling. If you have oscillation, they're not. Yeah, that's that's my issue. Um, Somebody on Reddit had something of like, do you think the distances are too short in game? And I'm like, yeah, the distances are too short in game, and it they're just they're just miserably short. Um, you know, and I understand a lot. You know, one of the things is the game is set up pretty good. If you think of this, right? Let's say you want, let's say you don't like to do big distances, right? Well, that's easy. You fly from here to here, right? Or you fly from here to here, right? The air bases are right next to each other. If you don't want to do long flights, you can easily go from here to here, here to here all day fly from here to here. You never have to leave this island if you don't want to. If you don't like driving long distances, you could drive from here to here, here to here, here to all day. If you like long distances, you could drive from here to here, you know. And so I was kind of disappointed. Like, you see where the Arctic is? The Arctic is uh, 45 kilometers from, uh, 45 nautical miles from Spy Cakes to here. It's 90-something kilometers. And so that's super short, man. Um, you know, I can do 180 knots. I can't maintain it. Even up at altitude, I have to drop it down to like 150 to stay cold, which I am going to improve my cooling a little bit. I want to keep some speed up. But, um, you know, you can get there in like 15 minutes. And so that is, it's not terrible. Um, the distance to the Arctic is not bad. What I was hoping is the arid biome would be equidistant down to the south. So I was hoping it would be down here. And so that way you would have, if you had uh, 45 nautical miles here, you would have 45 nautical miles here. That would give you about 100 miles to go from here to here. And so even in this plane, it would take me a half an hour to go from Tajin to the down here. I don't know why they would, you know, I know why they stuck it here. It is a bunch of people who are, and I don't mean this as a pejorative, but more casual. They want to jump in the game, have instant action. They don't really care about simulator. They just want to grab something off the workshop and use it. And those people should be catered to, but I think they're catered to too much. And so I think the devs are afraid if they move the island down here, people would say, oh, I can't use air biome. It's too far away. Well, what I would have liked to see was air biome way the hell down here. And then I would have liked to see, you know, tropical biome over here, you know, and put things... You know, a good distance away. This is all in a tight little area, and the Arctic's up here. You know what? You know what would have been made me happy? Put this sucker uh, 45 nautical miles down here. Okay, then put a South Pole down here, and then make it so it's like 250 nautical miles from the South Pole to the North Pole. That would have made me happy, and that would have made it so that airplanes are viable. Those of us who want a simulator gameplay could go from the, the the North Arctic to the South Arctic and maybe it'll take us an hour. You know, and you know what? You don't want to you don't want to go long distances. You could go from the arid biome to here in like 15 minutes. You can go from here to here in 15 minutes. And so you would have one, two, three, four options. And if you want to stay tight you can and then these would be close. These would be close. You know, this would be close to the southern Arctic. And that way, everybody can have what they want. 
And I think the devs jumped too much on the train of like, let's, let's, you know, play to that. But part of the reason I think they made it close was they didn't want to make a big, long train line, which whatever, man, you're already sticking trains in the ocean. Go ahead and stick another train in the ocean to the south. But, you know, give us some distance so those that want distance. And then by having them spaced one, two, three, four, those of us who want real long distances, we can go one to four. Those of us who want short distance can go one to two or two to three or three to four. You know, those who want intermediate distances can go one to three, you know. And so that would have made everybody happy, you know. Yeah, um... Yeah, you know, I, I get the temperature thing. I think the devs are scared of, you know, everybody's, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people are complaining about, you know, cooling's too weak, cooling's too weak. Um, so I think they're afraid of making it too hot because people already struggle to cool their builds. And, you know, a lot of what they do is like 50% off. And I think they should double the cooling effectiveness and all that would do is it would make it so that you would have more space. Like in um, in Triton, I have to take up quite a bit of space to do my cooling. Um, but all, you know, if they doubled the cooling effectiveness of everything, all it would make it was so that I could have half the cooling apparatus in Triton as, pos as I have. That would make it so that... Um, you know, it wouldn't be so laggy. Like, it's not laggy for me, but it wouldn't be so laggy because you have less, fewer nodes, people with some potato computers. But um, they should have doubled the, the heating effectiveness and made the arid biome hotter. And that way, you would have had to engineer a solution to go down and work in the Arctic. I think the devs were afraid is part of, and, and part of it's justified, is they're trying to appeal the game to a reasonably large audience. And so... You have a lot of people who have no engineering experience, which is perfectly fine, who have no mechanical experience, which is perfectly fine. And so they're trying to make a cross um, a cross appeal game. Like those super nerds like me who, you know, have a lot of experience with some of this engineering stuff and, you know, can make really complex systems. They have to make a game that we enjoy, plus a game that you have some nine-year-old kid who knows nothing about how anything runs for obvious reasons because they've never driven any vehicle in their life. And they want to make it fun for them as well. And so I, I certainly understand oversimplifying it to a certain extent. But some things they could do that I think would help them a little bit, like they could easily fix the grip on tires. Like these tires are gripped to two. So that's it. Um, and in my experience um, with operating with, you know, driving vehicles and, and airplanes, a wheel setting of grip of two works pretty damn realistically. That's what most of my stuff is set to two. My construction vehicles, because you tend to have big, big tires, but you need a lot of grip, I'll go to fives. Um, if they just made the grip slider go up to five, that would allow us, without having XML edit it, you know, to grip whatever we wanted. And you know what, the, those, you know, again, I'm, you know, I don't mean to disparage people, but it's like, say a nine-year-old kid, right? A nine-year-old kid has never driven a car before, right? A nine-year-old kid doesn't know how a car is supposed to behave, but it makes the game approachable that he says, my wheels keep spinning, my wheels keep spinning. And so he drags it up to five. Well, then he's going to find out he doesn't have enough torque to turn the wheel. But um, it's going to make it more approachable for them. So, you know, kind of like I was saying with the islands is, you, you know, you have some nine-year-old kid who wants to just grab something off the workshop and go tool around and spend 10 minutes in game, you know, because his mother tells him you can only have 20 minutes of screen time today. That allows that kid to go on, you know, Sawyer, and he can putt around here and he can drive from base to base, and that's fine. You know, the, the distances in game, again, if we think of things as microcosms, right, this is a microcosm. So you can go zip, zip, zip back and forth. If you like a longer drive, you can go from here to here. You know, you can drive long distance if you want. Um, if you like the longer distances, the one thing they're missing is longer distances. And so I wish they had stuck this island down here and let those of us who want some distance get some distance. But also, hey, you want short distance? Hang around Sawyer. You know, a lot of people were complaining that, you know, the, the same old people who want everything for free, they they complain that it was a DLC for the arid biome. Well, 
you know what, you can still do everything in Sawyer. You can stay there. And so if you don't like driving long distances, hang around Sawyer, drive around tight, or hang around the yard biome, drive around there. If you want longer distances, you can still have it. And so I think they can make this appeal to most of us. But, you know, things like putting that arid island, the arid island should be as far south as the Arctic. And I would love to see them put a South Arctic island. Give us some really long things. You know, for those of us who like to really do some complicated engineering, um, that's a challenge. You know, you have a nine-year-old kid who doesn't know how gearing works, who doesn't know how clutch works, who doesn't know how fueling works, and his vehicle, because of it, sounds like a lawnmower and burns, you know, 200 liters per second. Well, that's fine because he's only driving, you know, one kilometer um, it doesn't matter. His vehicle doesn't have to be super engineered. And so that makes the game approachable to him. And then you have somebody like me who makes, you know, something like this, who, which I could go to the Arctic and back 10 times in this. And so you can make the game fun for me by making it so that I can also make a super efficient vehicle that goes long distances. And so that's kind of um, my little rant on that. But I think they could make this game appeal to most people with some pretty simple changes like putting that island to the south. And I think they kind of bent the knee to the casual player, which I never think is a good idea. Um, the reason why I think they did it from a financial and business perspective is that a casual player is new money. A casual player always gets bored. And, and again, people take it when you call them casual as an insult. Calling somebody casual is an insult. You know, if you have, if you have a family and you have five kids and you need to, work all the time, you need to take care of the kids, and you need the dishes, and you need to clean up, and you need to take somebody to soccer practice. You're a casual gamer because you have, okay, I have 20 minutes, nobody's in the house, I can play a game. So you jump on and you casually play a game for 20 minutes. You can't get super involved. You can't spend 10 hours building something. And so you casually come into Stormarks and you download something from the workshop because you don't have time to play, and you casually drive around. It's not an insult. People take it as an insult for some reason. They all want to be hardcore. And so it's not an insult. And so, and somebody like me who plays a ton of this and also works a bunch, but whatever, but, you know, who, who can play a lot of time, I can still get into the minutia and make something super complicated like this and rebuild my aircraft just to give myself different, different readouts on gauges, but does the same thing, you know, and they can do that. And they're doing that all right to the game. I think they need to... From a business standpoint, why I was saying they like casual players is the person who gets bored moves on has a has a Steam library of 300 games. I don't I haven't bought an I bought haven't bought another game in probably six months and I barely and I didn't play it. I bought it on sale. I'll play it eventually. I pretty much stick with one game and I play it a lot, and I, I play pretty much one other game, and so, um, you know the the casual player will buy this game play it for a week, a couple weeks, a month, and then go buy their next game. So because this game is so cheap, and I know a lot of people complain about, you know, t you know, oh, you know, $30. You know, I, I can't go to the movies or dinner for $30 and get out of there, you know, and I can come and have thousands of hours of fun in this. And so I think the devs are afraid that, you know, they need a constant stream of money and so those of us who are really dedicated to this game will buy every DLC. And so I think they're doing a good job with one DLC a year. I'm happy with that. And um, for the casual player, they need to make this game casual friendly, which helps all of us because the casual player comes in, buys the game, plays for a month, buys the next game, moves on. And so the devs got as much money out of that casual player as they got out of me. And so from a business perspective, you know, the only way they make more money out of, out of hardcore players like me who play this game, you know, dozens of hours a week um, is if they had a subscription model. And that's not going to fly. That's not going to happen. Um, and so the casual player who comes in, plays the game, up, oh, sees a new DLC, buys the DLC, plays the game for a month, leaves the game. That's how they keep the game alive for all of us. So, you know, I definitely am not crapping on them. They keep the game alive for us. But I think the devs could do a better job balancing this. Move this island to the south, right? This is already stuck up right next to here. Move this just over here a little bit. Move this equidistant to the south. Give us a southern, even, I don't care if you copy-paste this and rename the stuff, 
But, you know, imagine doing container missions from up here down to there um, in an airplane. And then, you know, you don't want to be driving a ship all day long. Well, guess what? You can go from Spy Cakes to North Harbor or you can go Spy Cakes to Komodo. They did a great job with this. The ability to go from here to here to deliver container missions. If you want to do a bunch of container missions, you can go back and forth here all day. You want to go a little bit further, you can go back and forth here all day. You want to go a little bit further, you go back and forth here all day. You want to go really far, you go up and down here, you know. And so I just think they could do a little bit better job with that. Let me read some chat. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, the ADF works well. Um, let's see. I'm just reading all the chat. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I don't do video on my stuff just because I don't I don't need it. But um, yeah, I can see the lag with that as well. So the way my ADF network works is let me actually I'll fly around and show you that. Um, so <clears throat> I have an ADF station here, 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 where else? Um, military base. I have one here at um, Draymore. I have one here at the Creative Island. Then I have one on each of these. So I actually need to fly here and verify these. So let's do that. Uh, probably not. I'm in very much in a Proteus mood. Um, I can't get anything finished for the life of me. So I'm trying to get Proteus um, more buttoned up. So I'm trying to find my ADFs. So Island 1 here does not have an ADF. Um, Island 2 should have an ADF. Let me check it. Yeah, I'm not in a train mode. I, I don't do too much training. Very much in airplane mode at the mode. Where is this ADF? I thought I put one here. I don't see it. So that's craptastic. I need an... What is that? That's me. <laughs> uh, let me find the next one. So I'm trying to find these ADFs. I, so I planted them. I was supposed to plant them on these islands going up to the Arctic. And the point being that I can tell... I can. Um, navigate all the way up the arctic so i keep having to make new saves uh to get this this add-on system in right where the hell are my adfs i wonder if they're despawning um uh, nope i thought i put all these in i'm not seeing them though ah uh, crap where the hell are all these adfs i think let's see this should be one right here these are not coming in for some reason. I have to check what's up with my um, save. Up oh, here it is. Okay, so this one's in. That one's in. So those islands are not in. This one's here. So presently, see, this isn't a big deal, actually. I might do it for performance. Then Tajin has one right here. Um, so I'll show you some other cool things that you can do with ADFs. Is um, ADF again was the simplest and oldest. There it is, right there. That's uh, that's Tajin's ADF right there. And so one thing you can do is so say you want to find uh, BVG. BVG is right here, right? BVG freight terminal. So let me show you what you can do. So how to locate BVG using the ADF? Uh, purchase. I gave myself $5 million so I could do testing. So where are you at? There you are, guy. I could just unlock them all, but I hate having the little house. If you look on the map, when you buy everything, it has houses. You zoom out, it's all these freaking houses, man. You can't see anything. All right, so Tajin's there. Let's go ahead and... So I'll show you one of the ways you can uh, triangulate your courses. So this is actually kind of neat. So let's do a compass. And then I'll probably end up here in a minute. Kind of kind of got through some of the stuff I wanted to and then uh, at least got in the right direction show you guys and take a break and go do some videos but um, all right so the way that you uh, do triangulation here for your for your stuff is you can dictate a point with a couple stations and so let's look let's say I want to find BVG all right I can triangulate to BVG and so one of the ways I can triangulate to BVG let's put right here in the X of BVG 
logistics port, I'm going to put a waypoint. I'm going to use my, uh, so I'm standing right on top of the sucker. I'm right next to the GPS antenna. The GPS is literally right about here. If I look at that, right, that is a 140. So if we have a 140, so it's actually the reciprocal course, right? Because the needle will be pointing backwards. So it's pointing 140 this way. The needle will be reading backwards. So if, let me get grab compass reciprocals. So actually, let me try to do it in my head. 140 would be um, 320. Let me double check. Um, that might be right. I can't remember. Uh, there it is. So what is it? One four zero. Yeah, uh, three two zero. Yeah, that's what I said. Three two zero. All right. So you add. So the way you do the reciprocal is if the heading's one four zero, you add two to make it three. Then you subtract two from the next number. So it'd be three two zero. That gives you a reciprocal. So what we would do is as we if we, I wanted to fly from here to BBG, even the no station here. I know that that's a 140 heading to BBG. So what I would do on the map was you would draw a line. You'd say that that's a 140 from here to there. And then you know the reciprocal is 320. And you would keep your needle at 320 behind you. And you track and you get to BBG. And then you'd have a mileage. So you have something called distance measuring equipment. It measures the distance from station. So you know if you came out here on the 320 course, and as soon as you hit, say, whatever number of miles, um, let me, so that's 6.5 kilometers. So let's say half. So you're talking 3.25 nautical miles. When you hit 3.25 nautical miles, you'd be sitting right on top of BVG. Now, the way to triangulate that is if we were to go here. And so you can actually make a, a point in space if we stand here. And we look at that, that is the uh, 064, so it would be this uh, 244. Let me just double check that. Yep, 244 course um, from. So the 244 course from here. So if we know that, um, if we know that this is the uh, 320 course from, and this is the 064 course from. We get a triangulated course, and we can we can map a point in the middle of space. Now, this is actually really cool. So what I can do is this. So let's say we wanted to actually come up and do a full approach in here. And this is what I'll do is I haven't written an uh, approach for this. So what we would do is let's say we do this, right? We come in here, and actually, we don't need it that complicated. So I'd fly up, right? So we would fly to here. Let's say we want to continue up the Arctic. We can go to here, and I can go up about uh, 40 kilometers, so right about here probably from that station. Then I stop reading it. So this would be no, uh, no man's land here. So I'd just keep heading on that heading. And then when I get within range of this station here, when I get within 40 kilometers of this station, I can start reading it. And I come heading into this station. When I get to this station here, um, what I can do is I can draw a point in space, right? So what I would do is let's draw a point in space. So let's go from this here, and let's draw a final approach uh, fix. So we want to head to a GPS. We want to head to a waypoint, and this is what's going to set us up to land on this runway. So this will be our final approach fix right here. So that's the final uh, waypoint right there. So what we would do is, I, if I look at, um, so let's say we're flying direct to the station. So we're going over the station. Then we would head on a course. The course would be the zero, be the reciprocal course. So 039, so the 219 course from. So I'd head on, uh, I'd head 039, um, and I'd head out on the 219 course. And I'd head out for a certain number of miles. And then I can triangulate it with Tajan's course. So if we headed, I can't sit here. Let's put it right here. Uh, I can actually stand here. All right, so there's where our waypoint is, right? So now we're in, we're going to hit our waypoint. And then what we want to do is we want to track in on this, uh, right? The ADF is right here. And then we track in on the ADF. 
on the uh, 316 course 2. And so that's how we would actually fly the approach. We would fly up to here. We'd head out on the um, 219 course out. I would measure the mileage. So we'd have a certain mileage. And then once we once this course comes into 316, whatever the hell it was, 316, bingo, we'll go right into the airport. So that's actually how you draw, how you'd make a real life um, instrument approach. Let me read up some chat and then we'll probably end. Let's see where you're at. Yeah. Yeah, my I I would say that there is the grip is light, and the reason I'd say that is I have, like my my um my engine for my Mac Pinnacle. Now part of the problem is the vehicles are all oversized, so I have to I have to downgrade the RPM because the tire diameter is about at least probably fifty percent larger than it really is. Um, unrealistically, you can spin the tires of that tractor if you don't grip up the tires. If I grip the tires to two. I don't get any wheel spin, even except going into ninth gear, which I'm still baffled why it does that. But that gives me proper grip. I don't get any sliding with that. Um, one of the ways, reasons I say grip is too low, let's say I have a, a trailer and I'm towing it up on the roads. The roads are super slick. A grip of two causes so that I can park on a little bit of a hill and the trailer doesn't slide to the side of me like I'm on ice. And so that's why I would say a two is, is should be the base value of tires. Let's go through. Let's see. I so, um, you know, talking about lag in these towers, let's see, uh, count them out. I have one, two. I thought I had some on these islands. I guess I don't. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. I have 11 towers, I think. 11 of these ADFs. I'm only sending out um, GPS signal on a radio. They don't have physics flutters in them, which I should have put in there, but I didn't. Eventually, you know, I'll fix them again. But um, And I get no lag, and they're all in the world static constantly. And so they're pretty low, low poly, low. They're pretty low resource. Um, like if I zoom in here. Again, but you know, my I got a 3080 Ti, so I'm probably running better equipment than a lot of people. So, um, you know, I don't want people to go build up too much stuff and then worry about it. But like you see, this this is running. This doesn't have this one's this one's the most expensive processing wise, just because it has these legs. Um, the rest of them don't have any of these legs. I should have put a physics flutter in here. I didn't. Um, that would have helped, but I'll fix that eventually. But this is, uh, you know, this one has these legs. I could probably cut out the cross beams, but, you know, I, I have no lag. And these are always in the world. But, again, I don't. I run by myself. I'm not running any multiplayer. So you run multiplayer, you're going to get in the lag. Let's keep reading through. Let's see. Uh, how do you test the add-on without adding it to uh, World Start? Yeah, so let me see if I can bring you up a, um, uh, let me see, uh, I'll do that off screen really quick. Um, let's see. Uh, ADF approaches are going out of style. There's not many of them left because, um, there's not many of them left because they're expensive. You have to actually maintain a shack. The new way is RNAV. So RNAV, yeah, see, they literally switched everything to RNAV. Crap. Ugh. The place I, you know, of course, it was many years ago that I um, that I did it there. Crap, crap, crap. They're all RNAVs now. They're all GPS. Um, let me see if I can find ADF approach. Yeah, they're they're a dying breed. Let's see if I can find. Might have something in the house with it too. Um, EVB airport diagram RNAV. See, they're all RNAVs now. They don't have even have them. I have to find an old one. Crap. 
I want to show you guys what a proper approach plate looks like for a uh, uh, NDB runway 14. I'm trying to find it here. Okay, this one's here. Let me see if I can open it up and it's not miserable. Okay, good. So let's look at this. This is an actual ADF approach. And so uh, you have your NDB, your non-directional bearing. Um, that's what NDB is. You use an ADF to go to an NDB. You have Steinoff NDB 293. That's your frequency. And you get uh, dot, 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 dash, dot. So that's... Um, what you do is you tune in 293, you'd listen to the audio. The audio would go um, dot, 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 dash, dot, and you know, okay, we're reading the right frequency. And so the way the approach would work, let's go through the whole thing. Uh, NDB, that's a frequency, 293. Uh, final approach course is uh, uh, 111 degrees. Uh, minimum altitude, 5,000 feet. Uh, decision altitude, that's the decision you decide that you're either going to land or leave, is uh, 1,450 feet. Ground uh, altitude is 875 feet, so you'd subtract 875 feet there, and you know how far you are off the runway. Airport elevation, 600 feet. So you're, um, you know, that's, your, that's how high you, uh, the airport is. Runway is 575 feet um, above sea level. Uh, that's your mist in case you, you know, can't see the airport. The, let's say the fog's too low, you go. And so, let's see, what are we at there? Uh, four. So we're about 800 feet as low as you can get. So let's say if the if the clouds are at 600 feet, you have to, you can't land there, you have to leave. Um, so hopefully, you know, you're, you're checking your ATIS and it tells you you can get in there. Uh, let's see what else we have in here. So here's your triangulation information here. So you get a 315 course in, 090. These are your towers. I uh, see all these little pointy pokies. Those are all your obstacles. So towers, uh, 1,202 feet. That's why your decision altitude is probably so high is to keep you away from towers. You see all these towers? Look at all these 1,342-foot towers all around there. You don't want to hit any of those. So you come down here. And so you do it like mine. You come in, um, and so let's see. You're going to this. Looks is this straight in? This is straight in. So you come in. Um, so you come in over here. So mine is on the field. This one is not on the field. This one is actually out here uh, in the middle of nowhere. And that's sometimes they do that. And so you'd come flying and flying, and you you track right to the station. Then you'd go the 110 course. Um, you come in there and you try to land. If you couldn't see the airport, you come up here. Uh, so you climb straight ahead to a uh, distance of 10 nautical miles. As you can see, D10, distance 10 nautical miles, turn left uh, to VOR. There's a VOR there. You, It's a Fleischmann VOR. So you put in 110.4. You'd listen. It would be dot, dot, dash, dot, dash, 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 dot, dot. You listen to that. Okay, you verify that in. You go straight to it. So you make your left turn, go straight to the VOR. Uh, you're doing a hold with left-hand turn. So you come in. Uh, let's say you're coming in. I, it's not showing an inbound course, but you'd go 45 degrees off of this. Uh, so 340 plus 45. So you're talking um, 25 degrees. So you'd come in at 025 heading out. You would turn left. Uh, standard rate turn for uh, was it 30 seconds? No. Uh, you turn you turn around and just grab the you, yeah. You, it doesn't matter the time. You come in, you turn around, and grab the 160 bearing uh, radial in. Uh, you once you hit it, you would turn standard rate turn to 340. You'd track out for a minute. You would do a standard rate turn back to 160, and you'd hold. You really wouldn't hold. You'd leave and go do something else. But um, so that's a real ADF approach. DME is required, distance measuring equipment, because as you can see, uh, when we come down here, this tells us our altitudes. So as you can see our altitudes here, so the FMD DME. So this is, you're actually not reading the DME off of this um, ADF. You're reading the DME off of Fleischmann um, VOR. And so when you are 16.6 .6 nautical miles, you want to be at 5,000 feet. All right. Uh, you can see right here, 5,000 feet. At 16, uh, once you get within that 
16, you can start to descend. 15s, 4,400, and it counts it all the way down. So you start descending at 10.8 DME. You can go down to 3,000 feet. This is keeping you away from obstacles and whatnots. Um, then you want to come down to your decision altitude of 1,450 feet, and you would level off there. And um, you could, you'd level for a little bit. And then when you get to four miles, if you do not see the airport at four miles, you go missed. And so that's what that's all about. Um, runway visual range, you need to be able to see 1,500 meters or else you can't land. This is, um, let's see, this here is the type of lighting system. So as you come in in the clouds, you might, if you, as long as you see the lights, you can continue. You don't have to see the runway. It might be too foggy to see the runway. As long as you see the lights, you are allowed to continue. Um, then you're looking for the runway. So you see the lights, continue. Up oh, there's the runway, I'm landing. Um, and so this is a visual representation of the missed instructions. Go out to 10 DME, um, left turn 5,000 feet directly to FMD. So that's kind of what I'm replicating there. Let's go ahead and read some stuff here. When you open the add-on editor, each location will have those four options on it, the flag to test it. Yeah, I can test it. I'm, I'm trying to check it in the world, though. Yep, so uh, ADF is the simplest. Let's find so. ADF is the oldest, um, like most oh, deceased. I've died. Oh, yeah, the um, temperature. Let's go ahead and uh, let me bring up a freshie here. Let's look for um, VOR approach. So a VOR approach is much better. Um, Sky has a VOR approach. Um, Sky has a VOR approach and his aircraft um it's a lot more complicated to make so i haven't done it yet i'd like to do it eventually let me see if i'm blocking all you guys with my crap here so vor is much better and so if you remember the way when i was coming in on course i have to constantly make the number backwards so when i was going outbound i was on a 030 heading but my needle is showing 210 and if i turn to the left the needle would move the wrong way and so you have to think of it backwards in your head the whole time which isn't bad for me i've done it a lot but um it's it's more challenging so this is a vor and so vor um you could track the bearing in or out and so um you don't have to flip it around you don't have to flip it in your head it 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 auto flips and then the needle moves in the correct direction at all times so if the needle is off to your right you move to the right and then you get it back on in the middle if the needle is off to your left you move left no matter if you're heading there or you're going away so that's the frequency uh, approach course 344 landing zone touchdown elevation so that's how much uh, 7351 feet for the runway touchdown zone elevation is 845 feet airports 845 because sometimes you have a uh, you know like we used to fly in a white plane there's a big belly in the runway so it was actually uh, on a hill uh, ATIS is the frequency you get all your airport information so if a runway is closed what the weather is that's approach so you're probably come, talking to them um, Ground is 124.57 clearance. Um, so this is a VOR approach. You tune in your VOR 114.3. You get your uh, Morse code. You can listen to that. Um, the way we're going to do this approach here is you would, um, let's see, I'm trying to see exactly how you do it. So you come into the GFK VOR DME. Uh, you go outbound on the 164 course from, so you you dial it in. You would um, go out on the 146 from. Now, we can't do that with an ADF. We can't put in the outbound course. We have to have the needle reading backwards. So if we, this was an ADF, we'd come in and we'd go out with the needle showing 344, but we'd be heading 164. With this, we actually spin in 164, and it's very easy for us to go out on 164. Then after, we have to remain within 10 nautical miles. That keeps us from hitting things, as you can see here. Um, is that it? That's, that's our triangulation there. Keep us with, that keeps us in altitude. So we maintain, um, once we hit the VOR, we can descend down to 2,500 feet. This is, again, keeping us clear of these towers and whatnots. As you can see, it keeps us about 1,000 feet above our tallest obstacle. Tallest obstacle is 1,474. As you can see, we're just above 1,000 feet above that. So we come out on the 164, we descend down to 2,500 feet. 
Um, is it doing a DME on us? Let's see. I don't see DME. It just says remain within 10. Uh, yeah, so I'm not seeing a distance. So I think as long as we remain within 10, we can do our own course reversal. Um, so once we get out to a certain course reversal within 10 nautical miles, we can turn out on a heading, 119. So just like mine, we turned out on a heading. We go out for probably about a minute. Then we do a right turn. We come inbound on the 299. Now as, we, as we're as going out, what we would want to do is we would spin our VOR to 344. Now that's setting up our course inbound. Once we get off of our course and we are on headings, we can spin in 344. We go out for a minute, turn around after a minute, come in on a heading of 299. And then we wait for the needle to come in. Now the needle is going to be just like I did. Um, you can see that's the radial we go outbound and that's coming in. So we'd spin 344 as the needle comes in, we join the needle and we follow it in. And that's that's pretty much what you do in that. Uh, once we read the needle, uh, we can start, where is it? I'm trying to see our distance here. I'm trying to figure our distance anyway. Uh, we can descend down. To, okay, so what if we're within 25, um, if, if we're within 10 nautical miles and we're at 2,500 uh, feet, as soon as we join the 344 course, we can descend down to, um, looks like 1,300 feet until 2.4. I'm not sure what the final, where's the final altitude here? I'm trying to, okay, 1,360 feet. So yeah, we can go down to 1,360 feet. So that's what that's showing us is uh, go down to 1,360 feet. As you can see, it matches this level. And then the um, airport elevation is 845 feet. So we are about 500 feet, which is typical uh, above touchdown zone elevation. So we're coming in at 500 feet. If the cloud layer is at 600 feet, we can see the airport land. If the cloud layer is at 800 feet, we're never going to see the, or uh, at 200 feet, never going to see the airport. And we shouldn't have even done the approach. We just burn and waste and fuel. And so that's why you listen to ATIS. If the ATIS tells you that um, you have a ceiling at 200 feet, there's no point in doing the approach. Tell ATC, hey, we want to go somewhere else. Uh, because all you're doing is burning fuel and you need fuel. And if you're in the clouds, you definitely want some fuel. So thought that might be interesting for you guys to kind of see some of these approaches. Uh, let me bring up the last type. It's not the last type, but ILS approach. ILS is the most precise. Um, I think we'll end after that. And I'll talk about RNAV for a second, but hopefully you guys are finding this interesting. All right, so an ILS approach plate. Let's find something. I think you'll work. All right, so here's an ILS approach plate. So if we look at the ILS approach plate, ILS is the um, most accurate system. This is known as a precision approach. And so the nice thing about a precision approach is you notice those other um, approaches that let us get down within like 500 feet from the um, airport. So like I said, if, if the clouds are at 200 feet, there's no point in even going in there. We're never going to see the runway. We're never going to be able to land. Now with an ILS, what it allows you to do is get down to 200 feet above the airport. So if you know that the clouds are at, say, 250 feet because you listen to ATIS and the, um, and the ILS gets you down to 200, you should be able to get in. No problem. Now, you can even have it lower than that because as long as you see the approach lights, you can continue down to 100 feet. So if the clouds are at 200 feet, you may not see the the airport, but you can see the lights because the lights are super bright. Up oh, there, the approach lights, and that's one of the reasons why right in the chart, see right here it says uh, MALSR, VASI. So MALSR is your lights, and you have a VASI. Is, um, it's an approach light on the left side, showing you it's on the left side. And that's what the lights look like. So as we come in, we'll see lights that are shaped like this, a little cross, long, straight section. And so if we hit 200 feet, we see the lights. We can keep continuing down 100 feet. At 100 feet, if we see the runway, we land. If we don't see it at 100 feet, we leave. And we go somewhere else. So we come in here. Pretty simple. Um, you know, mostly you, would, you wouldn't be doing your own crap up here. You would actually probably get vectors from ATC. Um, your final approach fix is Fury. So most likely what they would do is they would vector you in. They would say you're up here. They'd go, I can play 245 uh, head turn right hitting um i'm not going to do it real but let's say uh 101 101 is actually probably right uh 101 uh head direct to fury 101 and then your needle would come in you'd follow it in and as you follow the ils in 
it would give you a glide slope. So as soon as you get in here, um, it fo you follow that in. So you actually are doing both lateral navigation and vertical navigation. You come in at 200 feet above field elevation. So where's field elevation? Uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. Airport elevation, 802 feet. So 1,002 feet. We come down to 1,002 feet. If we see the lights, we continue. Okay, we can go down to um, 902 feet. 902 feet, don't see the runway. See you later. We're gone, and we go somewhere else. So that's how you get in. Um, if you look at some YouTube, you can see people doing ILSs and all this. Um, you know, the new the new stuff is, um, oh, that's ready. Yeah, she's a, she's a little bit easier to see with the black background of me being deceased. But um, she's my new uh, splash screen, or my, um, I don't know what you call it, my, I forget what they call it. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, the new, the newest and the greatest is RNAV. RNAV is all GPS-based. They can put in, howdy, Jan, how are you? Unfortunately, we're just finishing up there, bud. I was talking about your ILS system and your VOR system. We were going over some approach plates, the glories of approach plates. So, but, uh, yeah, so hopefully... You know, the, um, the ADF system is working well. It's, uh, you know, it's part of the thing I like to do is the RP of having, um, trying to try to get rid of this window now that I put up there in front of my face. Um, one of the things I like doing here is having the, um, the RP of going over and um, kind of doing some, you know, time period correct appropriate stuff. And so that's one of the reasons. Oh, yeah, I saw Anno 1800 on Steam for sale. I used to like playing those games, but I just can't get into them anymore, unfortunately. Um, you know, I like having this ADF system because you saw how much work I had to do. And uh, it was it was a lot of work coming in. And you see how I screwed it up, you know. And part of that was, um, if we look at my approach plate again, do I have a clean one that's not all drawn on? It's, no, probably not. Uh, let me bring it back up. So you saw the approach plate. So you saw I, I made the mistakes and I came in, cut in with my course. This is too short of a distance. Um, you know, I was moving in pretty slow. I was moving in 70, say 80 knots. I'm still doing a mile a minute. That's only four minutes. So you saw how far out I went on the map. Like, can I bring up the map while I'm deceased? Probably not. Yeah, I'm in a, I'm in a career game, so it's not going to let me do it. But um, yeah, so the... Uh, you know, so four miles is really too close. And one of the reasons this is too close is like, yeah, I can get I can get Proteus down to like 60 knots. So let's say this is going to take me four minutes from here to here. So that's, um, it's it's a good amount of time, but I need to be able to send from whatever altitude I'm coming in at. I want to be at um, 1,000 feet, two miles out. So right there, two miles out is there. I need to descend about 2,000 feet. And I need to get down 2,000 feet in about, um, you know, two minutes. So it's not bad. I need to do 1,000 feet per minute, which is pretty standard. That's stabilized. That's why I made it like that. But um, now let's say you're in a jet. All right, you're in a jet. You're going 120 knots. So now you're going two miles a minute. This is less than a minute. So in less than a minute, I have to descend down like crazy. That's not it. So I need to push it out. Yeah, see, like I was showing these guys that we went out all the way. Oh, what did we go? We went out like, oh, I don't know, 15 miles. And so that's how big it is. And, and so the area in game is so compact. And so we used to approach at 200 knots until the final approach fix, probably. So we're about 200 knots, the final approach fix, uh, drop gear, drop flaps, uh, slow down approach speed of 120 knots. And you're doing that because you're catching up at, on planes. So if this is your if this is your final approach fix, right, they would land in good weather. They would land one plane per minute. In bad weather, they're landing uh, one plane every two minutes. So if this is going to take you right here, this will take you, I know this is all dirty now, but um, if this will take you, if this distance here will take you two minutes, that means that there's a plane touching down on the ground and you're right here. Um, and then the next plane is here and the next plane is here. And so they're going 200 knots and then you hit your final approach fix. This guy slows down to 120. So that's his, his uh, approach speed. This guy comes in, he's screaming in behind him. 
and they start piling up, and then he needs to slow down to 120, or he's going to catch. And so with the Jets, you really need to go way out. So let's see. Let's grab the map. So, like, for those who didn't see it, like, I came out. We were all the way up about here when I turned inbound. And so you see how long that distance is. Now, that was in a slow prop plane. Jet, you want to come in even further. You need that distance. And so I need to redo these approach plates so I can do them in any any plane. You don't want to have a different one for each plane. But, um, you know, so I hope you guys found that interesting. I screwed up the approach a little bit. Um, part of it was me talking and getting distracted. Um, you know, it would have been awfully boring and quiet if I just sat there and did the approach. But, um, I, you know, ADF is ADF is wonky. ADF is a lot more work. ILS is a piece of cake. Uh, it gives you much more information. ADF, you really have to be on. And you saw, we still landed, no problem. It just, I had to circle the airport. Um, wasn't a big deal. You can actually get those. That's a, um, oh, what the hell is it called? It was something circled, it circled the land. You could ask for a circle to land. So let's say you came in like that, like we did, and you can see the airport, but you're not set up, you're not established, you can't, you know, you're not uh, set up enough for the, the to land. Um, you could come in, say, sideways to the ADF, and then you ask for a circle to land. And so what that means is, or well, the circle land, you could, you got in close enough to see the airport, and then you ask for a circle to land, and then you visually did what we did. We flew around like this and visually came in and landed. So that's a circle to land. You make a circle and you land. So... A little bit, um, a little bit interesting there. So, the ADF system's working well. I don't know why these islands aren't in, but um, I don't really need them. Um, like I was saying, this is all dead zone. I actually kind of like it RP wise. So when you're going doing transcontinental flight nav, you're going from continent to continent. You actually you have nothing to navigate on out there. You now now you do you have GPS, but before what you used to do is. You had inertial nav, you had a bunch of other systems, you had celestial nav before that, but, um, you know, you can pretty much, there's no, you know, there's not enough people out there to worry about hitting. You might have somebody 20 or 40 miles away from you, and they're a thousand feet above you. You're not, you're never going to have to worry about hitting them. And so we can kind of do that and simulate that on the Arctic. I kind of think of this as like continental transition here. And so we could fly here and we can read all the way up to about here and we get a dead zone. And then we only have a dead zone for about three minutes. And then once we get through this dead zone, so what I do is in here, I put in the next radio, which would be here. And then as soon as we get through that dead zone, bing, this one lights up. We head up here to this ADF. When we hit the ADF, we're going to hit, uh, we're going to head out on the, uh, the course out, outbound from there. And then we triangulate a position from this ADF to this ADF. We get a triangulated coordinate here. And once we hit our tri uh, hit our triangulated coordinate, we turn in, and we turn right in. And so with this system, even as basic as it is, I can land with the fog up to about 50%, and that simulates probably about a 500-foot ceiling. Um, if I had the fog higher than that, I'd need an ILS to get in. And so at some point, I'm going to work on my own little ILS. And one of the reasons I want to make my own, um, you know, I... I I like Jan's better. It's more um, it's more technical. As Lou is a hell of a lot better than mine is. But what I would like to do is um, I'm gonna have to steal some. You know, this is gonna have to be in the future. I have too much crap going on right now. But um, you know, after Peak gets over and works not so insane, I would like to um, make a simple little ILS system that works essentially like this so i would do two panels and so i like to make you know i like to have a little less glass in some of my old planes and so one of the reasons i'm doing kind of these old timey um systems is that well actually i don't need that let's go like this so um one of the reasons i do this is i like to have some old timey planes so i want some old timey systems and so what i want to do is essentially make an ils like this and so you'd have your glide slope on this one and you'd have your localizer on this one and so this would allow you to put it in some airplanes without having to do a monitor, and you'd have a localizer glide slope. And so as long as these are centered, you're good. This moves off to the right. You need to adjust your course to the right, catch up with that. If this one's above you, you need to level off. You don't climb on an ILS. You level. So if it goes above you, you level. 
it comes back down. You ride it down. If it's below you, you have to descend. And then you you ideally keep the ILS centered and the glide slope centered. All right, let's do some uh, chat. Oh, I don't know. She's been sleeping. I don't think she, she might have walked in at some point. Oh, can you? That's nice. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to look at it. I like going through some of it on my own, too, just to learn some of the stuff, too. But, um, yeah, I don't think Jan saw it, but we went, um, we went FJ Warren up to the military base on ADF from the uh, military base up to Tajin. No, we didn't. Yeah, we did later. We we did a military base um, landing. Yeah, that was a different video. We did a military base landing on the ADF approach, but I need to redo some of my approaches. So I'd like to get an ADF approach for each one. Um, I don't really have a jet. See, the problem is I'm trying to finish up this um, this set of navigation system with autopilot. And once I get that done, I want to um, get that buttoned up so I can put it in the workshop. I haven't been putting stuff out in the workshop much. Nothing's finished. Work is nuts right now. I'm doing 55 hours a week. And so I'm kind of low on that. Once we get through Christmas... Um, you know, I got about four, three, three weeks, and then I'm on vacation too, so I can catch up on some stuff. Uh, deviation below glider and glide slope. Yeah, that's 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 what I was thinking is do something like that. Um, localizer should be pretty easy. Um, glide slope. Are you so, Jan? Are you making it so that you uh you get the actual three degree glides um the window? Let me bring up what I'm thinking of here. Uh, let's see. There was a good picture I should have saved. Um, where the hell is it? I showed it in one of the other videos. I should be saving some of this stuff. Oh, Google is trying to anticipate what I want instead of giving me what I asked for. Here it is. Uh, don't do that. Um, I have to open it in a new image, a new tab. Here's the ILS diagram. So, um, yeah, so you have your three degree glide slope. So that's from the ground to here. So for those who don't know, you have your um, your UHF glide slope shack. It's off the left side of the runway on this picture. And so this gives you your uh, vertical component. And so it's, it's putting out a beam and it's giving you a three degree glide slope. So as you can see, the further you are you, the further you are away from it, the thicker it is. And then as you get in, it thins and it becomes more accurate because of course you need that. You know, if you're, you know, if you're a thousand feet and you're off your altitude a little bit, you're not going to hit anything. If you're real close to the runway and you're off a hundred feet, you're going to crash on the ground. So it gets more um, accurate. And then you have what's called your localizer. Your localizer is at the end of the runway because you need to be aligned with the runway. And so that's at the end of the runway out in the bushes. And it puts a, um, a beam and you get the width. So you see how wide it is out here. And then you see how thin it is in here. And again, the same thing is when you're out here, you can tolerate some deviation. But once you get, as you get closer and closer and closer, you need to be more and more accurate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you'll, you'll get it. It'll be easier when I can show you. But, um, and then you have things like your marker beacon. So you have your outer marker here. Um, that's showing uh, four to seven miles. So it, it, I forget the noise of them. I can, I can still hear them in my head, but I can't really. Um, they beep at you, and they're different colored lights. So you usually go beep, 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 and then you get the outer marker, and you know, okay, we're. Um, that tells you your final approach fix for a non-precision, and then you get your middle marker. Uh, that's around your decision height. So remember, I was talking about your decision height. It's at 200 feet above the airport altitude. So airports at 400 feet. It's at 600 feet. If it's at sea level, it's 200 feet. If it's at 1,000 feet, you're at 1,200 feet. So uh, when you come in at 200 feet uh, AGL above ground level, if you can see your approach lights, you can continue um, down to 100 feet. At 100 feet, you see the runway, bing, land. If you don't, see you later. And so uh, this is the most precise way to come in so like you see you see airliners come in this is most likely what they're coming in on we used to come in like small airports we'd go gps um for some of them but you know if you get too low of a cloud layer you can't make it in you know so it's kind of ugly and so this this lets you get down to 200 feet and if you know we, we would ask them they'd be like you know you're going into an airport we would get a message to to uh to um go somewhere else if um to, di to divert if 
like say the the clouds are down to 100 feet or the visual range was too low they we get a message to divert because nobody's getting in and they'd say uh, nobody's making it into chicago right now um what's your diversion point we say uh we need to go to green bay and so they divert you to green bay and then we get to go sit in green bay with all the grouchy passengers because they're not in chicago and so um you know that's kind of the way it is but uh yeah so you know, I'm probably going to play with this. I'll try to grab some, you know, at some point. I'm not going to do it today. i got to get some stuff done. But um, I still want to work on this current system. Then I want to move in adding some um, ILS. So I need I need to talk to Yana at some point about some of the formulas because I don't want to go over the geometry. <laughs> and uh, But I want to work it, set it up so that it works on these gauges. So I'll, I'll have to talk to you about that at some point. But that will probably be after Christmas because... Uh, the rate that I'm kind of going with work. Let's see where you guys are. Yeah. If you lot, if you saw my, uh, yeah, vectors, uh, most of the time, like it's, it's funny. I was showing the guys, the, um, some of these approaches and, you know, the approach is like, you know, you brief the approach and it has this long explanation of how to get on the final approach course. And it's never that it's, ATC goes, uh, you, know, you can play 957, turn right, heading uh, 270, expect the ILS runway 6, and you, uh, 250, expect the runway uh, 6. And they would they would generally send you right, they'd vector you right in the final approach course, bing, ILS, down, and you're in, you know. And so that's about, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, um, I'll grab that from you later and set it in there. Um, but that, you know, that helps. And, um, one of the ways, you know, a lot of it's done with RNAV now. So RNAV is just, um, GPS. And so with GPS, you essentially, um, you know, one of the limitations of ILS is you have to have that shack off the left for glide. So you have to have the localizer on the back. You can do what's called a back course, which you can ride the localizer backwards, but the needle moves opposite. So you have to move you have to correct opposite. And then we used to have, low, uh, we could s press a back course button and all it would do is make the needle move in the correct direction. So in the airliner, if we're coming in on a back course, you click the back course button and now the needle moves just like an ILS. And the difference is it's now non-precision and you can only go down to 500 feet above the ground. So, um, you know, you do a back course every once in a while, it would bring you to the opposite end of the runway. With RNAV now, with GPS, like I was trying to show you guys, the New Smyrna Beach where I trained at. When oh, How many years ago was that? Oh, um, almost 20 years ago. Uh, they actually had an ADF, and we would do ADF approaches there. They replaced everything with GPS because they don't have to maintain a shack. They don't have to have somebody come out. They don't have to shut down the runway, the airport because they can't because the shack's not working. Um, with GPS, it's always working. And so that's why GPS, everything's switching to GPS now. They'll keep ILS because they need it as a backup. If the G, if you know, if they ever had a satellite malfunction, you need you need five satellites in view to keep RAM, which is um, oh Jesus, if I can remember what RAM is, random altitude. Some I can't remember what RAM is. Let me look it up. RAM was it's more. Um, let me see, RAM, RAM definition, receiver on, receiver autonomous integrity monitoring. And so, yeah, there's no way in hell I was remembering what RAM stand for. So you need RAM to be able to do uh, some of the approaches, and you needed five satellites in view of your receiver to be able to do that. If you went down to four satellites, you lose RAM, and you could essentially do non-precision stuff. Uh, because you need the fifth satellite to do your altitude if memory serves. And so you need five satellites in view at all time to do those things. So they, they're going to keep ILS because for like Chicago, it's they have somebody on field that can always repair the ILSs. It's not a big deal. And they have six runways going. And so... Um, and so, you know, with six runways going, they just be like, yeah, I left five lefts down. We need to switch over to five right. And you're like, all right, we'll, uh, we'll move over to five right. And you move over to five right, grab the five rights ILS and go in and land. You know, so pretty simple. But uh, I think we're going to end it up there, guys. Uh, good long one here. I'm going to take a break, go do some videos. Um, but uh, it's good hanging out.
Um, it's good to get some of the stuff done, kind of see what was going on with Proteus. I'm happy with the autopilot. Now, autopilot is functioning how I want. Uh, the hierarchy kind of took me a minute to figure out how I want it, but it worked well. The ability to leave my heading hold on and my nav at the same time, and then all I have to do is deselect heading hold, and it will track it on the nav. Uh, leave nav on, switch my heading, click over heading hold. Now it's going to track my heading, so that way I can uh, pre-select and get it set up. And so everything's working out really well now with that autopilot system. Um, one thing I want to do eventually is so... For those who might be interested, we'll say this last thing before I get off. But the so the monitor, so I need to so that last screen on Proteus that needs to be filled out is going to be a an enunciator panel. And so your enunciator panel, generally what you do is you have it on one of your screens in the plane. Let me see if I can bring up the Embraer. Uh let's see if I can get an Embraer picture. I know this one the best, so it's what I have the most time on. So uh Google is too specific sometimes. If I don't type in cockpit, it's not going to show me cockpit pictures. I'll try to show one with an there's enunciators right there. Open image, new tab. There we go. Okay, not too small. All right, so if we look at the cockpit here of the Embraer 145, so if we look at the center panel here, can you see my cursor? I don't know if you guys, you guys probably can't see my cursor. That's weird. Um, so the center panel, if you look at this, you can see my cursor. Okay, I'm moving it. So center panel, if you notice uh, on the left side, top left, you have your engine gauges, your N1 and your N2. N1 is your big fan. N2 is your compressor section. You also, I think we had turbine, but it read out as, as numbers below. Uh, to the right, you see those yellow messages? You see a bunch of stack of yellow, and then you have a couple blues. Those are your um, enunciators. Um, essentially, those are your caution and warning messages. And so your cautions and your warnings will pop up. A yellow is a caution, a red is a warning. Uh, your caution comes up, you get a ding. If you look um, at the captain's side, you'll see this yellow button there. There's also one over here on your FO side. It's not lit up. It's to the right. That light dings. You see how it's yellow on the captain's side? That's because we have a bunch of yellow messages. That will ding, and um, yeah, I know. I'm trying to get off, <laughs> but I get on these tangents. And so um, that's what I want to do with that last panel is eventually put in a bunch of caution and warning messages, and so we'll get a ver we'll get a audible ding, and a yellow will come up. It will go uh, caution fuel, let's say at an hour. So if I have an hour left of fuel, it will go caution fuel. That message stays up. Uh, we used to be able to click on that button and silence it and acknowledge it. And then if you have, let's say, less than 30 minutes of fuel, you get a red one. It'll go ding, ding, ding. And it'll keep dinging you. The red light dings where the yellow light is. And it says warning fuel. You have 30 minutes left of fuel. You could click that off to silence it. It would stay lit up red. And then after, like, say, 30 seconds, it would, it would go ding, ding. You know, warning fuel again, ding, shut it off. And so I want to do that with that screen. But all right, so I'll actually end it there, guys, and I will see you later. Have a good night.